to my uh, email, by the way. They gave the same canned response that they gave on uh, uh -huh. Twitter. Okay, I'm live now. Howdy, folks. Uh, we're up live here. Um, how's it going, Chris? Yeah, interesting. Uh, no notification, huh? I... I don't know. I think I posted that around 2.30, something like that. <laughs> that would probably explain why there's so few people out there. And uh, yeah, I got five now, so it's coming on. Anyhow, hey, sailing. Um, everything is... Basically loaded. We have a few last minute items, things like medicine, the computer, etc. But everything else is basically loaded. <laughs> and and ready to roll. Uh, fuel tanks are full. The current plan is to leave. Hey, William at about eight o'clock in the morning and try and get to Page, Arizona tomorrow. Uh, it's right up at the northern boundary of Arizona. And uh, then the next day we'll cross into Utah, about halfway across the state, and then we drop back into Arizona and go back over to Hurricane forget the name of that town. It's, it's kind of a weird, Fredonia. Yeah, we, we go to Fredonia in Utah, then drop into Arizona and go across because it's a flat, flat run uh, doing it that way. The other way, if you take the southern route, first half in Arizona, <laughs> it's up and down and windy and, and it's pretty mess. And then the other one, the, the northern route, the far end in Utah, goes through Zion National Park. So, as I said, this is it's pretty high speed, low drag run, kind of boring but pretty simple. And uh, the idea is to on Tuesday make it from Page to Nephi, and uh, meet up with Lucas. Towards the end of the day, uh, on Tuesday or maybe Wednesday morning, and I'm going to see if we can hang out at Lucas's place for a couple days because weather uh, forecast is for a storm to move through on Thursday, um, and so uh, the plan would be to just you know hunker down on Thursday so that we're not traveling. Happy New Year, Patrick. Happy New Year, everybody. Prince of Darkness. Not that I know of. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what the reference is, Chris. Maybe Lucas is the idea, but anyhow. And uh, from there, we'll play it a little bit by ear. We'll communicate with the people further up, most specifically Idaho Rogers because he's a truck driver and never know when he's going to be home. Okay, it was Lucas, huh? And uh, if we can time it to where we see him uh, on, on our way through uh, uh, Pocatello, that'd be cool. And then we're going to go up, uh, I think the name of the town is Summit, just past Twin Bridges, Montana. And... Uh, it's, uh, he wants us to hang out there for a couple of days, um, do some, some stuff with some rocks, etc. <laughs> oh, I don't need a Tesla pulling a 7,000 pound trailer. <laughs> but, uh, and so the idea is kind of pause a little bit as we go. And theoretically, the accommodation should be available 
on the 11th. And uh, that should work out about right. <laughs> and uh, so that all looks good. The situation looks like it's going to be interesting on the 6th and 7th in Washington. So it'll be uh, fun. I don't know how much. I mean, clearly a Tesla pickup doesn't have enough storage capacity to pull a heavy load along a haul. It might have loads of torque over the short distance, but I mean, uh, the energy storage of batteries just, you know, it's not going to pull a, well, in this case, a 7,000 pound trailer for 10 hours. I'm pretty sure it won't do a 500 mile range with a 7,000 pound trailer behind it. Got no objection to electric cars over short distances. Electric cars if, are idiotic. If you can if you can afford it and you like it and you don't mind building nuclear power plants to charge the batteries, I got no problem. They're an environmental disaster. And they're idiotic. <laughs> yeah, throw a diesel jet set in the bed, huh? <laughs> You know, for a while there, they were talking about monolithic uh, ceramic fuel cells, basically. It was a, 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 some kind of, basically a porous ceramic. They would run at elevated temperatures and work as a fuel cell where you could just use an ordinary, you know, like gasoline or diesel, it would gasify it because of the high temperature, combine it with oxygen and create electricity. And uh, they were talking about things like 60% energy conversion from the um, chemical energy in the fuel to electrical energy out of the fuel cell. If so, um, that would be nice. Now, I haven't heard anything about them in 20 years. So what that tells me is they ran into a glitch somewhere. <laughs> I mean, I haven't heard anything about them. So I don't know. And, uh, hey, smoking. But uh, IRC, what does that stand for? In real, that'd be IRL. But, yeah, catalyst life cycle. That would be my guess. Poisoning the catalyst, something like that. Uh, that would make perfect sense to me. Because... Aside from that, it seemed like a really, so, <sighs> stick man camo? Doesn't sound like I did. Let me uh, zip on over here, smoking. Um, I presume you sent it to the hard rock you at outlook.com let's see uh looks like accommodations will be available on the 12th yep okay all oh, is smooth so far weather very mild no snow to speak of. okay so just got confirmation uh at my destination that everything seems to be going good but the accommodations will not be available till the 12th and I do not see anything from smoking. Checking your spam folder. I'm looking. Let me see. Let me switch here for a second. Um, Stickman camo. Nope. Uh, no, no stick man camo anything. Um, did you send it to hard rock you at outlook.com smoking? Uh, I don't see uh, mining magnets yet, Chris. Haven't heard anything. And let me just check something else while I'm at it. It is kind of nice being able to do this. Uh, okay, that I don't care about. 
And yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh huh. Man, that's some some uh, business deal with immense uh, opportunity swarming. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Come on, let's. Get them all hooked up and get rid of them there. Yes, I want to delete them. Thank you. So, yeah, smoking. I don't see anything there. And let's see. Crap, miss the U. Yeah, pretty much. There's some dude with hard rock that's <laughs> going, what the hell? Uh, yeah, it's a good question, uh, Chris. Define the difference between paramagnetic and diamagnetic, if you would, or if you can easily. Hello, Adventures We Trust. We're available to join the gold journey if you guys need help. Okay. I presume that means if we're on the road there and we run into trouble, we can... Uh, oh, email Adventures We Trust. Where's my... Yeah, of course. Where's the pen? Who knows? Yeah. Adventures. Well, liberty we trust. I like that. Thing. <laughs> At Proton Mail. I never heard of Proton Mail. I've got a Proton Mail account. Really? Yes, it's a it's an encrypted secure account. There's no ads. It's private, and it's free. Very okay. limited email uh, capabilities if you use the free account. But yes, I have a proton mail. Okay. Per minute is attracted. Okay, so in paramagnetic, you're inducing magnetism. Is it only while the um, electric field is applied, or is it uh, uh, has a little res residual to it? Okay. All righty, smoking. I'll try and uh, look at that as soon as I can. Chris Georgie says, uh, don't you know, send any top secret stuff over Proton Mail. <laughs> um, I wouldn't send any top secret stuff over email. Remember, yep. I wear a tinfoil hat. <laughs> Very proud. But you make a tinfoil hat look so pretty, my little one. Yeah. I, I very proudly wear my tinfoil hat. Thank you very much. I don't send anything over email without assuming the entire world reads it. Actually, she has a, I don't know, what, what kind of hat do you call that? It's got the ear flaps and, you know, like that. And with a little chin strap and everything now so she can keep hunter her. Hunter hat. A, a hunter hat? Yeah, perhaps. Or a hat. Yeah, you know, kind of like a main, you know, the kind of thing you'd, you'd see some somebody up in Maine wear. But, uh, yeah, we got outfitted with some warm weather gear. Uh, we both got insulated waterproof boots now and hand coverings and head coverings and uh, reasonably good coats and such. An Elmer Fudd hat. Yes, that's exactly yes. what we're talking about, except it's black and not it's, – it's basic black, not plaid, because plaid just clashes with almost everything. Uh, actually, the only reason it's gray as opposed to plaid is because they didn't have a plaid one that fit me. I like the black. I thought it was good. Um, but anyhow, so we've, we've got some warm weather gear now. Um, went to uh, 
sportsman's warehouse, and the young lady there was extremely helpful. I forget what her name was, but anyhow, a tall blonde, what, 20s maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Kaylee or something. Yeah. But anyhow, she was, she was very helpful, was able to direct us what we needed. And, uh, so let's say we now are reasonably well equipped for reasonably cold weather. And uh, interesting, Chris. That, that could be useful. <laughs> um, I know he was, uh, um, I know Coulter was interested in the possibility of inducing eddy currents or something like that and then using a magnetic field to move the gold during the time that it has these eddy currents running in it. Beyond that, I'm not sure. It's it's uh, it's got electrons involved somewhere, and it, it, yeah. So, but uh, so that's basically the deal. Um, I insulated the windows on the Minor Bago with uh, bubble wrap, so they're essentially double glaze now. And uh, the all the fluids are checked. All the gear cases have been checked. Lights. One of the lights on the trailer had got water in it, so I had to replace that because it was all rusted. One of the flashers wasn't working now, so I got that fixed. And hmm, interesting, Chris. Yeah, it'd be fun to do some experiments, which we probably will someday, or at least Coulter will. We'll get him some good stuff, and I bet you he'd, he'd have some fun with it. He seemed like a really nice guy. Um, yeah, he seemed like the kind of guy, sort of like myself or maybe you, Chris, where you see an issue and immediately start saying, how can I fix it? How can I make a tool or a process or whatever that will deal with that? Um, that's that's my impression of Coulter. I say a nice guy, nice guy. Really enjoyed his visit here. So, anyhow, that's our basic plan um, at the present time. And uh, I say that I, I must admit I'll feel much safer up in Nephi on the sixth. <laughs> well, down here in Tucson, because <laughs> Lord knows what's going to happen down here. And uh, say so once we get to Nephi. With uh, full tanks in the in the truck, yeah, we can we can make it all the way to our destination, no problem. Yeah, Chris, I say that's that some of us are just kind of natural born inventors. I mean, that's just you know, if we we see something and it's like, well, you know, this tool just doesn't do the job well enough. Why doesn't somebody invent something? It's like, well, why not me? <laughs> One time uh, for the kettle corn, I needed a, uh, I wanted to see if I could get a salt shaker that would deliver the same amount of salt every time and shut itself off. Uh, Patrick, we're planning on departing tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. is the scheduled time. Uh, we have less than 30 minutes of loading to do, things like the uh, comforter and the foam pad on the bed. Um, uh, which of course we can't load tonight, some medications, a little this, a little that, but less than 30 minutes total. And, uh, so that's, you know, departure time. And, um, it looks like our accommodations will not be ready until the 12th. So unless I'm, I can't, add anymore that means eight days is that inclusive or not let's see we could probably show up there anytime on the 12th so we got the fourth fifth sixth seventh eighth ninth tenth eleventh so we need to need to make a three-day trip last eight days <laughs> uh, and it shouldn't be uh, not too bad Um, I don't know what I did 
Chris was I, I made a, a, a salt shaker that basically had an inner container and the annulus around the inner container um, was the out, you know, there was an annulus there to the outside of the actual salt shaker. The inner container had a lid inside the lid. And then at the bottom, there was a funnel that went into a, uh, a cup basically. And that cup would only hold so much and it would, it would run down in there. And then of course it would stop. Then when you turn it upside down, the salt from the cup would run on the outside of that cone down the annulus and come out the actual shaker holes. And that way my employees could consistently, you know, salt the kettle corn. Never really um, did much more than that. But uh, I noticed that uh, McDonald's, they're using a, a, a somewhat similar device now. And it makes, you know, if people just are not machines and so you can teach them how to do it and, and what it is, but even things like the, um, uh, the moisture in the air will make the, you know, salt clump differently and different brands of salt will, will behave differently. And so getting the, the proper dosage was, was being a little annoying at times. Yeah, pretty much. Exactly. But yeah, it was a, it was an interesting concept. Every once in a while I come up with something that's like, yeah, that ought to work pretty good. One time I was uh, very, very annoyed at my boss at Goldfields and uh, being a loader operator, you know, it, it may look really glamorous from someone on the ground. Uh, and, but when you're loading trucks and one truck every two minutes, you know, I figured in about, I think it was three years, I loaded like 300,000 trucks or no, 300,000 scoops. That's right. It gets pretty boring after a while. So I'd be, you know, doing stuff in my head. And so I was really annoyed at my boss um, to kill time because you know, everything else is going kind of autopilot. It's like driving down the freeway once you're good at it. Um, I was like, could you invent a weapon of mass destruction that would only kill rich people? And I actually came up with not a bad idea. I won't describe it here, but <laughs> it's like, damn, that could work. I better not tell anybody. Uh, yeah, it... It's really not that much effort. You know, everything, you know, it's all power. You got an 800 horsepower diesel engine behind you that's doing all the work. And all you're doing is turning a steering wheel and, and pushing a couple levers and, and some foot pedals. And it's really not that much physical exertion now. You know, back in the old 50s, 60s dozers and stuff where you're actually, you know, like a, I, I drove a TD15 International one time. And I mean, you know, you're, you're actually pulling brakes and clutches and stuff like that and it took um some physical effort but the new stuff no i mean it's it's air conditioned the seat suspended <laughs> you know and as such i mean it, it makes sense because the easier it is for the operator the less tired they get and therefore the more productive they are and certainly um, you know, if it's, if it's cold or if it's hot or something like that, it's really not going to be helpful in the productivity department. So they, they go to a lot of effort now to make them that. I've never used an old cable dozer. Um, let's see that TD 15. Trying to think. Yeah. It had, it had a hydraulic rams. I've, I've driven an old, uh, you know, mechanical linkage uh, motor grader that had a pony motor to start it. 
you know. Yeah, that too. Um, I don't know if you, how many of you people know what a pony motor is, but in the old days, getting a diesel engine started was not that easy. Nowadays, they have higher compression, they've got glow plugs, and I mean, even at 40 below, it's pretty much just turn the key and fire that baby up. But in the old days, not so much. The, um, what do you call it, the, the motor grader we had, had what they call a pony motor. It was like a little 15 horsepower gasoline engine. That's your starting motor. And you basically fire it up. It has an electric start. And then you engage it to the flywheel. And you can just crank that engine a long, long time, whatever it takes to, to get it going. And uh, yeah, if it's a decent pony motor, it's not too bad. I mean, in, in Arizona, you know, southern Arizona, it's not that cold. But the other one, that TD-15, which is about like a D6, you know, it had, a, it was a gas over diesel engine. You, there was a, the compression reduction lever there where you would, you know, run it, drop it from like 20 to 1 compression ratio down to like 8 to 1 compression ratio. And you'd, you actually have a carburetor. You know, it also engages a carburetor bypass sort of thing, so that now you're 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 running a carbureted engine and it had spark plugs, and so you would you would start it on gasoline, let it run for a little bit, warm up, and then chink switch. You know, you you engage the diesel injector pump while disengaging the compression reduction and the carburetor. It worked okay. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it was less than ideal. And uh, it's, I it, say, it just has more complexity. The newer equipment is, is definitely better. It's got better brakes. Um, the engines run longer. Um, don't know about the injector pumps. I mean, the old the old engines, you ran that sucker out of fuel, and <laughs> you had some issues getting it restarted. But one of the problems with the old ones was, too, um, you ran it out, you know, you killed your engine, and you lost all your power, everything. Nowadays, um, they have a hydraulic pressure off parking brake. So if you lose hydraulic pressure, the parking brake automatically applies. It's, it's spring on, hydraulic off. And so that's a good thing, <laughs> you know. And uh, so um, we didn't have to clean the plugs too much on that TD-15. But uh, as I say, the newer equipment is much better. Uh, the brakes on caterpillar haul trucks are awesome <laughs> the the brakes on the caterpillar haul trucks are multiple disc oil cooled brakes it's it's like a clutch pack with like 20 or 30 layers to it you know every other layer is engaged either the outer hub or the inner hub and then it just gets pressed together with hydraulic pressure for braking and it's all bathed in the hydraulic fluid uh, so it's cooled by the hydraulic fluid. And I tell you what, man, um, those things could stop on a dime, uh, heavily loaded. Uh, we were looking at, you know, upgrading to bigger trucks. And as they went over to the testing grounds over in Tucson, this, I, this one I lived, worked in Yuma. And he said they took this 125 ton truck and loaded it to where stuff was falling off the sides and the tailgate and up over the mow board. And they were taking it down a 10% grade at 30 miles an hour. And they had a little thing where when you hit the brake pedal, it would fire a paint charge into the ground. So you could see when, when the guy hit the brake pedal. And it stopped that truck in about 135 feet at 30 miles an hour going downhill overloaded 
on a 10% grade, <laughs> you know, and uh, that, let's say the, the Caterpillar haul trucks had awesome brakes. The older um, diesel electric trucks, one of the problems with them was the, I mean, basically you have a diesel engine, he has a generator. The generator runs electric motors on the wheels. And this is, they just didn't have transmissions that could take that much uh, power. It would just blow transmissions. So this is the only way they could get the that much horsepower to the wheels. Uh, and in order to go down a long grade or whatever, instead of using brakes, they would use what they called a retarder. And they would uh, turn the wheel motors into generators. And they had a big resistance unit up there. They called it the toaster. And it would basically just take all that energy and turn it into heat, like a big gigantic room heater with fans blowing to cool the heating element down. And so you could go down a long grade and you weren't, you know, wearing out your brakes or anything like that. But because of that, they didn't have really good brakes. And if you got over a certain critical speed, the efficiency of the wheel motors went down as the speed went up. And so, as you can see, once you get past a certain speed, if you can't hold that speed, you will never hold that speed because it's going to go faster and faster and faster on you. And... That's not a good thing. So I say the newer the newer trucks have much better braking systems. They're much safer. Um, vast improvements. Absolutely. Yeah, when I worked underground, we had uh, disc brakes on the drive shafts of the little Getman trucks we had down there. Oh yeah, that's right, Chris. I mean, it's that's where they got the technology from. You know, it's it's the same thing. But boy, I say, it, 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 if you get past a certain speed, you're screwed. <laughs> that's all there is to it, man. <laughs> you ain't gonna have a, a happy ending after this one. I personally don't like situations like that. Yeah, Jake brakes work great for uh, those applications, you know, like like semi trucks and stuff. It's it's great. Um, I never, I don't think they've they use compression brakes on any of the big equipment. They just have really good brakes now. You know, the multiple disc oil cooled brakes. And uh, I say it. There's very little wear because it's oil bath. And there's very little wear that goes on. It just basically goes into shearing the oil. It's kind of like the, the a fan clutch on a uh, on an engine now. You know, they have a viscous fluid in there, and it's shearing that fluid heats the fluid. And then they, they have radiator fins on it, et cetera, to, to keep it from overheating. Say so in, the, in the case of the, the trucks, they just have a lot of hydraulic fluid being flushed through there with you know, 3000 PSI pressure and then running to your hydraulic oil cooler, which is, you know, like at the radiator. Yeah. A fan, fan clutch is kind of like a torque converter, but, uh, I'd say that's, that, that's how the, uh, the wheel brakes on the, um, Caterpillar trucks were in, they were awesome, man. No, no fade. And you want to stop, they will stop. You know, I, I, it was impressive. The, uh, the loader, of course, you're never going fast on a loader and you've always got the bucket you can drop on the ground and drag. Um, which, you know, that's a lot of, a lot of drag there and you can always drive it into the berm if you need it to, you know, into the high wall if you're going down a long grade and for any reason lost your brakes, but I've, they've, they've got so much power to the wheels um, in order to just crowd into that muck pile 
that I've, I've never heard of anyone, you know, losing control of a loader going downhill unless like the, the drive shaft snapped or something. And that can happen. Usually the U-joints, not the shaft in general, but the U-joints will wear out. And then when you lose a U-joint, bad things happen. I once was uh, working underground and I was what they call a grizzly hand. In other words, the trucks, which were actually a little smaller than a pickup truck, would back into the the area on top of the, the big chute, you know, 100 feet or more down to the track level. And there's a grate with holes, I don't know, 20 inches across, 18 inches, something like that. And they just dump on that. And anything that didn't go through the grate, I had to put through the grate. You know, you got sledgehammer and shovel, stuff like that. And this one guy comes up and he, he's, you know, got some muddy stuff in the back of the truck. So he's going like this, you know, try and get it out of the bed of the truck. And I'm looking at his drive shaft. The U joint's got like 20 or 30 degrees of slop in it. And this is, again, this is a drive shaft brake. It's got a the, the transmission output. And then there's just some carrier bearings and a brake disc. And then the drive shaft goes from that. And things go like this. And I'm like, whoa, 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 stop it. And he's, and he's like, you think I can drive it back to the shop? And I'm like, I wouldn't. I think you better park it right there, dude. Because, uh, you know, you lost that. Because I'm, And I'm not saying that it was part of the braking system that was the braking system <laughs> your service brakes were that disc you lose a u-joint past the disc and it's freewheel city you know yep that's what i was doing and uh the it wasn't too bad normally because a lot of the materials it was basically soft sandstone and i remember um uh, one day they were just hauling pillar muck and dumping it. I mean, they just sent some new sledgehammers down, which was good. And we had like two or three guys on the Grizzly. And a truck would dump it. I mean, there'd be a rock that was about the size of the whole top of the Grizzly. And we just start at the edges and just start whacking it. But, I mean, every single sledgehammer hit, you'd knock off a 20 or 30-pound chuck. Just bam, bam, bam. That felt pretty cool, man. You know, it's like, wow, we badass. <laughs> Uh, once we're in Montana, how long before we are back at the mine? Um, actually, at the mine itself, at least Montana Prospect B would probably be late April, mid-May, someplace like that before we can get to it. Depends on how much snow. Um, we may be doing, uh, we probably will be doing uh, significant experiments in terms of extraction improvements. And Chris may be helping us uh, to do the float, you know, do flotation tests and stuff. Uh, Chris, it wasn't, they were the blast. They were, it was ballrooms coming down. <laughs> you know, they weren't blasting it. It was just stuff that's coming down and being mucked out. Um, but there's also another gentleman there. He's trying to get some financing together. He has a, uh, a polymetallic deposit, copper, and, and a few other things, but uh, supposedly fairly rich. Um, and if he's got the financing that comes through that he's working on right now, he's got, he says, a month or two of underground sampling I can help him with. So that could also make for some interesting videos. And uh, uh, we shall see what happens. But I'm, I'm guessing that the next three months in terms of mining will primarily be in milling, trying to figure out what's the best way to get the gold out of that ore so that by the time we can get back to the mine, we have a plan on what to do with the stuff. So that's my estimate of what's going on to go on. Of course, what happens is whatever happens. Life is what happens when you're making other plans. But um, the I need to do another article for the uh, California Mining Journal 
Because uh, you just got another one published. Yeah, got another one published. Uh, very good. I mean, I'm, I'm so glad Chris Ralph uh, suggested that I <laughs> write articles for them. It's been quite a help. Um, but uh, I, I think I, I want to do an article on, uh, for those of you who saw our, our, uh, our surveying with uh, simple hand tools stuff last summer, um, again, it's a very simple technique, but it's not necessarily intuitively obvious to most people. So I think that would be good to do an article for the ICMJ, especially as it can, uh, I've got pictures I can pull off of the videos and I can also direct people from the article to the video so they can actually see it being done. So that's kind of cool. By the way, little one, can you take over for a minute? Uh, I suppose. Well, I've got to absent myself for a few moments here. <laughs> okay. It's not terribly well, optional at this time. I mean, here I am trying to play my games and become an imaginary trillionaire. You know, I've, I've got to collect all my free coins before we get on the road because, you know, I don't check my email off on the road. So how is everybody? How was New Year's? We did nothing for New Year's. Oh, well. And yes, I agree, Chris. It is a very good topic for ICMJ. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we're going to drive fit safe. I mean, we always do. Hi, smoking. How you doing? <laughs> no, it should be a nice drive, though. I mean, it usually is a nice drive. We enjoyed it when we were driving up before. Well, New Year's was actually pretty quiet here, too, Chris. I mean, I heard, you know, some typical fireworks around, but not the kind of fireworks we normally hear around our house. And nobody was wasting ammo, which was rather interesting. Normally, there's a lot of people wasting ammo. Good afternoon, Adrian. How's New Zealand? Two or three days of storms. Well, we're heading into a place that has actual weather rather than Tucson. Can you to... check for his email? Smokin' says, can you check for my email? I'm all excited you someone to see it. Okay. Let me see what we got. Smokin' probably found a huge nugget. Let's see. Uh... Uh, I uh, I presume this is uh, you smoking from Juneau, Wisconsin. Let me see what happens if I click this link here. If I lose you all, I'll be right back. And let's see. It's buffering. It's buffering some more. It's got the little circular thing going round and round and round, but nothing's happening. I'll go ahead and just leave that in the background for a moment, and uh, hopefully it'll it'll buffer itself, and then I can go see it. Uh huh. May not because you're on another window. I don't know. It's it's hard to tell. Hey Adrian. So I say it's there. I just don't know what's going to happen with it. Oh. And it took a long time to load up. Yeah, well, that that does seem to be what's happening here. Let's let's go back and see if we've uh, got it. It's still loading. <laughs> Anyhow, so that's that's kind of the thing. We got the 
with a tally from the trees. Um, surprisingly, we actually, according to the, the boss, uh, we did more sales per week on the same week from last year basis this year than we did last year, but we were just short one week because of that our total sales um, is, you know, w was less, but we, we did make it well into bonus money, which is good. And then there was the uh, uh, extra money for Eva cashiering. And then there's the firecracker money. So all in all, it worked out pretty well. Uh, I felt much more comfortable this year because I'd done it all before. Yeah, Adrian, this is going to be one um, interesting year. I, I guarantee you that. Um, I have some interesting stuff lined up. I mean, I I haven't spent a cold winter anywhere. Oh, my God. Since you were in Gallup, New Mexico, working uranium. Yeah, in the 70s. That's the last really cold winter because when I was up in Washington State, it wasn't that cold. But there were actually days it was colder in Tucson than it was in well, Washington. Well, you did make a snowman once in Washington. Yeah. Yeah, it, it worked out pretty well. I say, um, if it wasn't for the damn shoulder, it would have been pretty smooth. I would have felt pretty good. So. All in all, it was definitely a positive. And uh, we'll see next year what we're doing when. Yeah, I mean, in Bellingham, it was really weird because, like, you know, the weather would be a high of 36 and a low of 34. <laughs> you know? And certainly it was warmer in Tucson, but it was also colder in Tucson. So that was kind of funny. But where we're going, we're going to have those, you know, 30 to 40 degree temperature swings. So, yeah, I mean, just, just looking at the weather, what was it, 40s to the teens, something like that. So what's that, 20, 25 degree temperature swing, you know, pretty significant compared to, say, Bellingham is a couple degrees because it's just nothing but overcast. I can do that sometimes here in Tucson, although usually the humidity is too low. But yeah, well, we'll see what happens. Um, well, we had snow a couple of years ago during the rodeo. I'm just, yeah, I've, I've had snow at Tubac during a, a kettle corn event. Yeah. But uh, hopefully it, it'll be interesting in terms of we'll, we'll make some progress on the extraction and then actually try and get to doing some mining and stuff. Uh, this year. That would be fun. I, I know that my principal up there would like to set up a small mill to where he could also custom mill small batches from other people, too. So we shall see what we shall see. But that uh, that that could be interesting to actually be mining down there. Although, if I was going to be mining, I'm probably going to have to find someone else with a strong back. You know, Eva... She's she's great. I love her to death, but she's she doesn't have the strength to be a miner. Well, I can get stronger. Uh, I don't know if you can get that strong, little one. Well, I can at least get something done. Yeah, but I say you need you need two people that can basically uh, do some grunt work, especially some of the timbering that'll need to be done, etc. It'd be nice to have a good experienced. Uh, minor to help out with that. We'll see what happens. The, the situation say it'd be kind of interesting trying to figure out where the the ore is. I I just got this nasty feeling that they pretty much mined most of that out. And so then we can uh, do some better evaluation and stuff. But there's, there's a lot of area there where 
I just did very superficial sampling and um, even a little bit of drilling might make some sense, you know, not, you know, huge amounts, but I mean, you know, get in the vein there and, you know, punch a six foot hole, you know, every three or four feet, something like that. So you can get a, a good idea of what you're looking at and then plot that and, and see what you need to do from there. Because uh, if that, if the ore chute is kind of vertical, that would make sense what they did. They just kind of intersected it with the decline. And by doubling back, you should be able to, to continue to extract. But how deep it goes, Lord knows. You know, but we might actually be doing something like this, <laughs> yeah, going down the, the, uh, the ore chute. And six to ten feet cores. Um, the problem with cores is that I think it probably takes a little more uh, energy and it's definitely more expensive than just uh, percussion drilling. I mean, if you can just, you know, take a uh, essentially like a masonry bit with a spiral drill bit and, and you know, drive it in four feet and just collect the cuttings, then that would be pretty useful for the preliminary sort of uh, sampling. And I think I'd be looking more towards the, uh, the floor of that decline because the ease of access, and as I'm, I'm just suspicious that they pretty well mined out what's above, but they may not have mined out what's below. And that's what I'm saying. I mean, if the, and if the vein's running this way, but the mineralization runs more vertical, and they came through it like this. And there's even one spot where they doubled back and went in this way. And uh, clearly they found something in the floor there. Um, yeah, but a backpack drill, a gasoline power drill underground, is not gonna work too well. Um, uh, that's, that's the thing. And gas will kill you real quick underground. You have to have enormous amounts of flushing air to make it really uh, reasonably safe. If you had a diesel, uh, not so much, but even then I'd have to run ventilation in. So we'll see. But, you know, an electric drill is pretty easy. And uh, that's why I was thinking, you know, something, you know, more the size of the Hilti, that sort of deal. I mean, Hilti and Bosch make such things, uh, electric drills. And then you just have to set up a small generator up on surface, some big extension cords, and have at it. Now, that's possible, Chris. Um, but and say, we shall see what we shall see. And uh, if the preliminary sampling, I mean, I can do preliminary chip sampling on a much tighter pattern now that we have a better idea what we're looking at. And... Uh, might, let's say, just run the uh, run rails down that middle decline to the switchback point, uh, you know, where you get past the ore and then switch back and dive back into it and, and start the actual mining there. And uh, since you're not actually following uh, an ore gradient, so to speak, you're, you're, you're cross-cutting, probably take the switch back at a more reasonable angle, like 20, 30 degrees, and just dive down till you get there, then turn around and come back again and, and like that. Uh, that might be uh, pretty effective. We'll see when we get over there. Well, the, the problem with coring where we're at is we're actually in the vein, and so we're, we're, we're coring parallel to the vein, and we're not cross-cutting the vein. So it won't tell you the width of the vein or anything like that, just wh whatever you drilled into it there. That's why, you know, if you had a like an impact 
hammer type drill and you just drilled a series of holes across you could even you know this is foot walls you know this is the north side this is the center this is the south side and like that <coughs> you know smoking i really don't know but i don't see why they wouldn't yeah the problem with a spiral per se as opposed to switchbacks is that most of the decline would be in waste. And by switching back, you can keep it in ore. And, and therefore, all your, all your development is essentially production. Once you've, ex you know, you, you start at one side and run it back until you hit waste on the other side, and then you turn around and you come back until you hit waste on this side and turn it around and go back. And that way you're also going to pretty thoroughly ascertain the dimensions of the ore chute and define that, you know, where the, where the ore, ore waste boundaries are. And you'd also get a good idea of the width and structure of the vein as you're, um, you know, advancing. And that would give you a pretty good concept of what what the heck you're going through. If the ore continued down, you could you could go a long way before you uh, uh, ran out of room to work. And by knowing where the middle decline is, and knowing where you're at in the ore body. There may be, you know, significantly lower down where you can just go a little bit further, hit the middle decline again, and, and now you're you're hoisting up that instead of having to hoist it up switchbacks too. It's hard to tell. Tesla has autopilot. Yes, they do. I'm not exactly sure sailing what that has to do with the conversation, but they sure do. Um, Couldn't pay me to own a Tesla. <laughs> Crap. Eva has strong opinions. You may have noticed that. But anyhow, so say so that's kind of my thought. No, Elon Musk. Once we get back to the mining part of the deal, we also have uh, waste dumps that we can go through and just by screening theoretically recover um, a fair amount of ore, which would be really good for um, testing. Uh, there's also, we can drive a drift into the 40 foot level from the outside um, dozer road level to get better access also. You know, that would get us, say, basically at the 40-foot level. And that could be useful. We could also start at that outside dozer level and run a decline to intercept the ore body. Um, wouldn't want to do that right away. I'd want to define the extents because you'd be running that totally in waste and i'd be a little reluctant to spend that kind of money until i have a better idea um, hi aries how's it going i've got a, a pretty good idea where it is compared to the surface of the mountain right there um but there's other things to check out that might be useful that we haven't uh, um, ascertained. Um, but say right now, the next thing is to come up with a reasonably efficient extraction process. Right now, um, well, at, at the point where I left, 
the gravity extraction was woefully inefficient, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% recovery, which like totally sucks. Hey, Canadian Gold. <laughs> I don't know about that, Chris. Um, and again, when you're, the, the vein is perpendicular to the hillside. So to cross cut the vein is not going to be easy with the drill hole. You're going to, you're going to be drilling a lot of hole for very little or intercept. And it's just not terribly efficient. Um, and that's unfortunate, but oh well. And uh, they will worry about that when we have to worry about it. Right now, we'll burn that bridge when we get there. You and I got some work to do on the extraction technique, Chris. Because <laughs> that's that's what we got to do first whether it be some kind of leaching, preferably with something relatively non-toxic. Um, uh, there's halide leaches and stuff like that. You know, Chris, you can get an oblique, but I mean, you're going to be punching real quickly. You're going to go in 50 foot of drill hole to get five foot of intercept at a 45 degree angle. Uh, unless that vein gets bigger, it's not going to be terribly efficient. Now, that doesn't mean it couldn't be done, of course. It could. But uh, I think that, yeah, I, I, I suspect this is going to require something besides gravity, uh, which is fine because then we get some other, something else we can sell. Um, but in terms of, of drilling... Yeah, it's just going to be really, really inefficient. And if we've got ore available, I think developing through ore uh, will, first of all, give you a lot of material for sampling and give you, you know, a lot better observation of the ore body than you could possibly get with drilling because you're actually going to be able to see things in situ. Uh one of the things we need to check this this vein is essentially perpendicular to the ridge line you know here's the ridge here's the vein you know and so if you look crossways here's the ridge here's the vein and we need to check the surface intercept and see if we can find any other ore um there was some workings on the other side of the ridge. Um, it's hard to tell what there might be at, at real depth, but if you can trace that surface exposure all the way down basically to the valley floor, then you could uh, get, theoretically, start a lot closer to any uh, secondary enrichment zone to drill and see what you could find. And uh, yeah, electrical, I mean, there, there's a lot of possibilities. And uh, I, I would say that aside from just tunneling in ore, geophysics would make a lot of sense, um, especially as it's clear that there's similar structures in this, this same ridge. And so it would be nice to see if we could uh, locate something that the old timers couldn't because it had no surface exposure. Don't know. Does it come to a flat iron at the ridge face? I guess what you're trying to say, is there a little outcrop at the at surface there? The answer is no. It is not the, the, the host rock is fairly hard, durable quartzite, uh, sed sedimentary quartzite. And uh, so 
it it's not any more resistant to weathering than the uh, the host rock, which means you'd actually probably have to be trenching across it. Most places not bad, but right beneath the the portal is a dump. <laughs> So you'd have to get below that dump and then trench across and see what you could find. And uh, so you can do a bit of map and remote imaging investigation. Okay. Um, if you can whip up some kind of a rough basic proposal, um, be certainly interested to look at that and then pre perhaps presenting it to the uh, to my principal there um, love to see you up there It'd be great to ha have you up there for a bit Chris uh, um, probably uh, 20 hours of driving from where you're at I have to go to Reno basically up probably like Boise oh, cool or Twin Falls and then over from there. Yeah, I'm thinking about a 20-hour drive. Um, let me check with my principal and make sure it's okay, and I'll get you this, the lat lawn, and uh, you can see what you can come up with, okay? But again, the, uh, the principal on this is uh, wanting to maintain a fair level of um, confidentiality. Okay, Old Med, send me the point cloud. I'm not sure what that means, Old Med. But yeah, I say we I, I certainly have no problem with that. The the structure can be traced on the far side of the ridge by holes that have been dug in it. Uh, just not you know, the, the sampling didn't seem to show anything there. Um, hey, Oltmed, how's it going? Are you going to Lodar you? Hi, Oltmed. Uh, Happy New Year. But, uh, yeah, as I say, we can, we can see what possibilities there are. I just, I, I'm getting the feeling that this is a, a relatively restricted ore shoot. Uh, there's other... There's another claim he has on the other side of the ridge, a little further north. That would be um, Montana Prospect N. Um, and there seems to be similar type structure that has multiple declines on it. Um, none of them look secure enough to really just, you know, rappel down and see what's going on. But um, there was no really high grade that we were able to ascertain. But we really weren't. We were just getting dumb samples. So that's not surprising. Um, you can go across the valley and get a good line of sight on the side of the ridge real easy. Yeah, you wouldn't need to. Uh, send up anything uh, airborne to get the side of the hill. Um, I don't know if your LIDAR, if it's just a straight LIDAR, I don't know how much good that would be um, if it's spectral imaging, multispectral. That might be useful. I don't know. Hey, Old Med, um, and for everyone else who just got in late, um, we're going to be heading out tomorrow morning about 8. Uh, plan to get to Page, Arizona by nightfall. Actually, probably a little bit past nightfall. We should be sleeping. Um, there's a big flat spot right next to the road just... Oh, I guess it would be south or east, probably southeast of the Glen Canyon Dam Bridge um, on the river side of the road there. And that's probably where we'll be spending the night. Um, 
we might go just up the road. There is the Walmart in Page. We might be there, but we'll see. Um, yeah, an imaging spectrometer might be interesting, Chris. Uh, the uh, next day, we're planning on going to Nephi, Utah, and hang out there with Lucas for a day or two. Weather reports are Thursday should be uh, stormy, so um, we'll get there like Tuesday evening in theory and hang out there until Friday morning and frolic on from then once once the road's cleared up again. Um, Gene, uh, I don't think I have your phone number or anything. If you can uh, send it to me um, so I can communicate and, and program you on my smartphone, just send me an email at hardrockyou at outlook.com, and you will have to do that fairly soon because I'm uh, not going to, you know, <laughs> have comms for very long. We'll be headed out first thing in the morning. So if you can, if you can send me that information tonight, that would be great. I can call you tomorrow, whatever. And... Uh, then we can go for there. But we should be up in Montana uh, next week. I mean, the um, we, we, we can't, we don't have accommodations until the 12th in Helena. So there's no sense trying to get to Helena before then. We're uh, kind of taking our way. Um, Gene, were you the one in... Bozeman. Okay, well, if you've already got my phone number, I think maybe you're Bozeman. Let's see. Yep, I got you, Gene. I see you there. Okay. And, uh, yeah, uh, we should be there, you know, around the 10th or so. We're going to be, uh, the plan is to go up through Twin Bridges from um, Dillon. Uh, we're going to be staying at Summit probably a couple of days, visiting somebody there. And then we were going to head up to the interstate and head east to uh, Three Forks. Then the plan was to go from Three Forks to Helena. But from Three Forks, it's not too far to Bozeman. And uh, so we might could meet up or whatever. But yeah, we're uh, we should be there, you know, in about a week. Um, so remind me to uh, call Jean when we're up there too, okay. little one. Okay, because that ought to <laughs> kind of fills up the trip. You know, turn a three-day trip into a ten-day trip, no problem. And uh, hello, Chris, how's it going? Um. If you've never done one of our live streams before, basically it's a whole bunch of guys kind of hanging out in the living room chatting about stuff. Um, quite often I'm just chatting about whatever I'm doing and everyone else is uh, using the uh, texting commenting function to uh, do everything else. If you have any questions about anything or you want to jump in, go ahead. Um, as you can see, uh, Oltmed and Chris have a side conversation going on about multispectral imaging. <laughs> Gene, I think I just got your text. It feels like it. And uh, little one, uh, unfortunately, you're going to have to take over again for a minute. Okay. Okay. So, see, this, this is the way it is, Chris, is that uh, my beautiful wife here uh, and mining partner and such uh, will cover for me. We, uh, we do good as a team. She was a great cashier this year <laughs> at the, uh, the trees and the, uh, fireworks thing. And I know nothing about mining. I am busy playing games at the moment on my computer. Well, what do you mean you know nothing about mining? Hi, yeah, a bunch of guys. Hey, I am so used to being called dude online that it's not even funny. Everyone assumes I'm a dude. I don't care. 
you, you guys are welcome to assume my gender despite the long hair. No, seriously, everybody thinks I'm a guy online. I hang out in too many male skewing places because, quite frankly, a lot of the chicks out there in the world now aren't really kind of nuts. It's, it's weird what has happened. Not too many normal chicks in the world anymore. Yeah, Reddit, Stephen. Reddit and uh, the Donald Dot Win, as a matter of fact. I spend a lot of time on the Donald Dot Win, and I do spend time on Reddit, but Reddit is a really, really weird place. Even the corners I hang out in are weird, and I hang out in the normal parts. So, yeah, I know, Chris, it's really weird. Well, this space, Chris Fox, is where we discuss microscale hard rock gold mining and other things associated with microscale hard rock gold mining and prospecting. So, Basically, um, if you have any questions about hard rock gold mining, about how to analyze or uh, there are people in the chat that are all about metal detectors and stuff and uh, just things like that. Ooh. Yeah. Good for you, Smokin. I still have some, some um, summer sausage. I don't know how anybody normally ends up here randomly, but uh, yeah, our mining education videos, Chris, other Chris. Well, I'm looking forward to getting to see your claims too, Gene. I really enjoyed looking at the claims we looked at over the summer and I love Montana. I cannot wait to get up there. Bear just has this unnatural dislike of cold weather. Now I personally am not a fan of it either, but Montana is worth cold weather. Mm -hmm, getting lost in YouTube land. Guilty. Very, very guilty. I get lost in YouTube land sometimes. But basically, uh, we're all ready to go, and it should be a good trip. Okay, Smokin, I will keep that in mind. I hope we can get it to load. It, I think it may not be loading right now because we already have a live stream open. It may be a bandwidth thing. I don't know. Altmed, yeah. YouTube laying can be really weird. Yep. The algorithmic guide probably threw you here, Chris. And yeah, micro scale. Most of the people on here have hard rock mining claims, uh, gold mining claims that are leased through the BLM or uh, Forest Service or state land. And we're all into gold and uh, silver and such. I personally am more a crystal and gemstone person, but well, you know, bear likes gold and bear invents um, equipment for gravity extraction and uh, milling of ore. And yes, uh, Jeff Williams does drop in here occasionally. He drops in here sometimes on chat to talk to us and then we have a really good time because he is really cool. Yep, yeah, some Canadians too, Stephen, and some Australians and some New Zealanders. Oh, you got sulfides, Gene. Those are always fun. At least they're usually better than arsenopyrite. Arsenopyrite totally and completely sucks. It sucks rocks. Oh, the puns get out of hand, huh? That's not my fault. I rarely pontificate. Oh, 
Chris, I love Jeff Williams. I love Slim. Okay. I really think Slim is totally cool. One of my favorite videos of Jeff's, he's got two favorite videos of mine. One is the one where he made that beautiful diorama with the river to show fluid dynamics. And the other one was the one where he panned gold out of Home Depot sand. That was so freaking cool. <laughs> Yeah, Chris Giorgi, the Arsano Pirates come with a lots and lots of gold. The problem is you can't freaking process them. They, they stink in that regard. They suck rocks. I mean, the one claim that uh, Bear was working on in Oregon a couple yeah, of years ago. Serious. One part sampled yeah, 40 ounces the, to the uh, ton. It was our um, Sino Pyrites. Can't do anything. The Russian with it. Revolution or the French Revolution. And you'll see what happens once. The, I would think the that uh, the Home Depot sand in California would have power, gold in it because uh, it probably comes from California. It's probably yeah. local. All right. But I thought you that was care, so dude. cool. All right. Um, the problem, Bye. Chris. Fox with Arsino pyrites is the gold is bonded to the arsenic and that makes it a really hazardous thing to try to process. Bear is back and he can explain why we hate Arsino pyrites and they suck rocks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what's the basic question? Uh, uh, we were discussing Arsino pyrites. Yeah. Arsino pyrites are often very rich and, uh, the negative is it's really hard to get the gold out of them by anything except leaching. So that's what we're trying to do. It's um, the, yeah, I've, I've seen assays of 40 ounces to the ton. And um, if, if you can concentrate the arsenal pyrite, and then just deal with that. Uh, it makes life a lot easier than if you're trying to like direct leach arsenal pyrite ore. So that's kind of what we're trying to uh, to accomplish. And one way to do that potentially is flotation. One of the problems with arsenal pyrite gold ore is the gold tends to be really really fine and just not amenable to gravity concentration. But flotation is another potential method of getting a good concentration and once you've got the concentrates then you can leach the concentrates a lot a lot more practically because you know, the, the grades are much higher the amount of material you have to process to get you know an ounce of gold is much less and that uh, uh, makes for a, uh, a more economical operation. Yes, oh, arsenal way, Chris, as in arsenic. That is by correct. By the way, Chris Fox arrived here via Jeff Williams, to which <laughs> I said Jeff Williams is like totally cool. How did you? Uh, how did you basically make that transition? I'm just curious. He doesn't uh, know the algorithm. Got the you. algorithm. Okay. Yep. And. Uh, so that's cool. Um, the Chris, um, my channel uh, is more in terms of geared to informational on how to do stuff. I kind of survey mine. And, and, you know, like surveying mine stuff. We, we're actually going out and actually doing things and explaining how we're doing them and why we're doing them as opposed to a more educational channel, I mean, not educational, uh, entertainment type channel. Um, <laughs> and so it's more of a how-to with hard rock gold. Hard rock gold, by its very nature, uh, is going to tend to be much finer than uh, you know, regular placer gold. A uh, couple videos of mine ago, if you take a look back, it's like, you know, fine gold and super fine and ultra micro fine gold <laughs> behave differently in the pan. You can see in the pan what, what I'm talking about when I'm saying, you know, uh, 
hard rock gold is fine. And mind you, that's coarse for hard rock gold. Okay, it can get a lot finer than that. It gets finer than flour. So um, that's where, you know, that that's what I tend to do. Uh, we're heading to Montana tomorrow morning. Uh, we were going up there next this summer, but due to the political situation, we'd kind of like to get out of Tucson uh, well before then and before all the hoorah happens in Washington this week. And we're week. not going to talk about the political Hush, situation. Hush, we're not. I'm just saying. So that's why we're leaving early. Um, and we're going to stop a few places on the way. And then once we get there, we'll this winter is probably going to be more in the processing research end. Um, and no, I am not set up to do assays, Gene. Um, that, that may be something we set up there in Helena. Um, and, uh, but we have a good assayer. Yeah, we, we do have a, a, a good assayer that we use. He's very fast. He'll usually get your results back the same week he gets it. Um, and he's reasonably priced and we've double checked his, his assays, but, uh, anyhow, so let's say we're, we're going to be hanging up there. Uh, we try and do these live streams about once a week, usually Chris, and there's another guy named Chris Georgie. You can see him right there. Uh, and, uh, he's really knowledgeable about a lot of stuff. we got old med. He's uh, into drones and remote sensing stuff and everything. So we have a lot of interesting people here that have different knowledgeable. So when people ask questions, we, we try and answer them. Uh, and when we have actual questions in terms of ore bodies and this and that and the other, we can kind of bat it back and forth and, and discuss it and kind of cross pollinate a little bit. So it's, it's fun. Um, and uh, so uh, Gene West, uh, complete kind of new. Let's see. That works too. Okay. So I'm thinking you want Gene, the, uh, the assayer. And this is Lawrence Hittle. Uh, he's the guy that we used last summer primarily. We, we cross-checked him against two other labs on about three or four samples and got really good agreement. So um, we, we found that we were pretty comfortable with him. Uh, it's $45 an assay, and that includes the sample prep. And uh, he, uh, he gets your, I mean, we were typically shipping out samples on Monday, you know, on Monday in the mail, you know, afternoon mail uh, using priority and getting back the results by Friday evening. <laughs> uh, planning on being there all summer, Gene. Um, the uh, once we're up there, there's no reason not to. We got lots to do up there. Uh, the only change in plans was just heading up there early. Um, so we should be there till, you know, late September. And that also depends on what's happening down here. Like the COVID stuff, uh, the reason we had to come down when we did was we had some, some kettle corn work to do. But, you know, theoretically, I was supposed to stay here until end of February because rodeo. And they canceled the rodeo. So nothing really holding us here. Uh, yeah. Okay, Chris. Ooh, I 
How's that, Chris? <laughs> what did you do? No, he's, he just wants me to put that. Uh, it's, it's a good point, uh, Chris Georgie makes when you when you send an, uh, a sample off for being assayed, you want to tell them what kind of sample it is. Is it a rock sample? Is it a concentrate sample? What approximate grade you think is in it? And what other stuff? Like, is this arsenal pyrite? Is this a telluride, et cetera? Because they, the assayer may modify his techniques to take those things into account, both to get you a better assay and also to prevent cross-contamination of his equipment that he doesn't realize, etc. And uh, let's see. <laughs> yes, Chris Fox, Montana. And no, we don't like the cold weather up there, but again, circumstances are kind of pushing the time frame here. Uh Usually, we do the live stream Sunday evenings so far. Right now, this would be our normal time, but there may be other times that I, I do it. And if you subscribe and hit the notification bell, sometimes you'll get the notifications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Gene, that would be fun. I also want to try and get some fishing done this summer. Last summer... It was a very shortened season due to my surgery, and as such, uh, we didn't have a lot of time to just go around. We, we did, took one day off to go to Great Falls, uh, but it was raining that day anyhow, and I couldn't do any sample prep. <laughs> I want to go. I want to see those ringing rocks when we get Yeah, we'd want to do the ringing rocks up there, and also, um, it would be nice to take, you know, three or four days and go up to Glacier. That would be nice. I don't know if Eva's ever seen anything like that before. No, we haven't done Glacier yet. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think you've... The closest I think you've seen to anything like that would be the pass uh, interstate... Not interstate, but State Route 20 through the Cascades, where you start getting... And just as you go over the pass, it's starting to get steep, and there's a little bit of snow in this now, but it's nothing like Glacier. I mean, I've been up on Mount Baker and such, but. Um, Northern California all washed up now. I don't know. I don't, we don't want to go to California if we can avoid it right now. <laughs> I'm allergic to California. Yeah, that would be kind of nice, Chris. Um, and say, typically we've been pushing time limits, so we're just rolling. You know, we got something up there that, you know, try and get whatever we can done. And then we got to be here by a certain date. If we have a little less time pressure on us, that would be nice. Well, since we're going to be out of California, we have the time pressure. Yeah, let's say we'll see what happens. But, uh, yeah, um, Chris Fox, um, I do consulting. I, you know, even I like to travel. We go different places and do different things, uh, typically all gold mining in terms of, of, you know, professional sort of stuff. But we just love to travel. Oh, yeah, we, we looked at the weather report, Gene. <laughs> yes, it's not bad right now. Hopefully it doesn't get bad. Okay, I'm Keith. And that's Eva, you know, Hello. and uh, yeah, Gene, uh, Thursday, there's supposed to be a storm moving through. So we're going to be uh, theoretically hunkering down in Nephi, Utah, uh, wait for the storm to go through. There's a gentleman there that wanted to, us to visit anyhow. So we may may spend a, an extra day there. Uh, hard to tell. Um. Maybe like running multiple claims, Chris, more like doing different work for different people at different times sort of thing. Um, oh, you helped uh, Jason. Oh, Chris. 
functional Geiger counter. Where's the Geiger counter? Does Gonzo have that? I think Gonzo's got the Geiger counter. Do we need a Geiger counter? Um, because we did, we actually had a Geiger counter. <laughs> what did we get? Five bucks for that thing? It was a. It's not a prospecting Geiger counter. It's it's one uh, the old civil defense Geiger counters. No, we don't have any solar charges this time. We're pretty much you know, the truck's wired for everything, secondary battery, charging circuits, and all kinds of stuff. And that's what we've used up till now. Uh, but uh, if we were out in the field for long periods of time, we might need something like that. And uh, well, why would we need a diver counter? I know we had bring it with you for checking along granite contact. Well, it's a little late now, Chris. You should have said that last week. I could have got it, but between now and eight a.m. would be kind of rough. Uh, I I can probably have him ship it up there if we need it. Not a problem. Yeah, I'm kind of a consultant. Um, I also, you know, I'm, I'm looking for a good property to, to, to work on, on a steady state thing. We're developing uh, equipment to do right now gravity separation, but Chris Georgie is going to be working on some flotation stuff that we might um, uh, work and, and my specialty is what you might call micro mining, micro scale hard rock mining. Uh, the sort of stuff where, you know, two guys, demolition, hammer, shovel, wheelbarrow, that sort of stuff. If you've got good high grade ore, um, then, uh, you know, make it work. And so, yeah, you know, that's that's kind of what I've been doing so far. Yeah, the you know solar uh, panels make a lot of sense now, especially if you're really off grid for a while. Um, the kind of stuff, the the equipment I have to take in the field to do what I need to do, quite often requires a generator anyhow, and so. That's why it hasn't been a big issue up till now. Oh, somebody else texted me. Who's this? Damn president keeps asking me for money. Man. <laughs> you think the guy have enough? He's got more than I do. But anyhow. Make sure you get an amorphous that is are they more efficient or are they just a lot cheaper? than uh, crystalline solutions, Leanna Love. Why do I micro mine instead of the big stuff? Because I don't have millions, tens of millions, or hundreds of millions of dollars in order to pay for the permitting. That's why. Um, if you're a substantial size mining company, uh, the permitting process can be killer. There's a big copper mine, about 30, 40 miles from me as the, as the crow flies. Hi, John. Um, and they've spent over $100 million getting all the permits. They got the permits like 10 years ago. They still haven't been able to mine because they keep getting sued. And so uh, the problem with, you know, medium scale mining is the permitting costs tend to be just, insane as a percentage of your total thing. If you can do it on a small enough scale, the permitting becomes much simpler and uh, the big companies go bypass a lot of small stuff because it's just not big enough for them. I mean, even a, a small to mid-sized company is looking for profits in the neighborhood of tens to hundreds of millions of dollars in a few years. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm perfectly happy with, you know, a quarter million dollars a year for two years. <laughs> you know, that's fine with me. But it is simply 
uh, not um, commercially viable for them. So that gives us a, a niche that can work. Uh, yeah, Chris, yeah. Once you're doing big stuff, all you see is paperwork. Yeah, you have people who do nothing but push paper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that's the whole purpose of the micro scale mining. If it's if it's a rich enough ore body and it's an easy enough extraction, you can come in there and process it on a scale that's so small that you can avoid most of the permitting entirely. Um, you know, we're we're talking stuff. We're like two guys with demolition hammer, shovel, wheelbarrow like that. I can move with a, with a shovel and a wheelbarrow. Once it's broken, uh, if I'm only hauling it a few hundred feet, I can haul easily a ton an hour myself if it's a, a horizontal run. Um, there's a video I've got on my channel uh, where I was working with Max's mine. And it was, what was it, about a 150-foot haul, yeah. something like that. You know, and I was helping, you know, digging out his tunnel, getting him access. And uh, then, I say, if, if you got about Ryan's shit. Ryan's one shit. ounce to the ton material, one ton an hour, if you can process that, yeah, that's almost 2000 bucks an hour. Well, look, at Ryan's, look at Ryan's dumps. Yeah, and then I so say there's a guy down here south of town that has a mine, and his dumps are running uh, a half an ounce to the ton, one of them. And, I mean, that's shoveling the sort of thing. I mean, there's probably, I think I estimated about 50 or 100 tons there in his dump, just a quick rough estimate. And uh, um, so, again, that's that's not bad. The key is to have equipment that can efficiently recover the gold from hard rock ores. This is not easy um, because, first of all, you have to pulverize the rock, and then you have to do something complicated to it or work some kind of gravity extraction that will recover gold down to, well, a thousandth of an inch or smaller, basically like powdered sugar or smaller. And this is not a negligible difficulty. <laughs> so that's kind of what I'm doing is trying to create that equipment. Um, and then I can sell the equipment also. But then I can do consulting, uh, equipment manufacturing and sales, and joint venturing. Um, I like doing different things. I don't want to sit one place for 10 years doing the same damn thing every day. Bores me to tears. So by having something like that, well, secret, that's up to Eva. See, the problem with Eva is she likes my hair longer. She thinks it looks sexy, you know? And I wouldn't want to, you know, like disabuse her of the notion that I'm actually a handsome guy if she cuts that off and sees what I really look like, eh, you know, who knows? This could be a bad thing. Well, the only thing I dislike about your hair, Bear, is that Walter Cronkite part, you know, <sighs> that really ridiculous all the okay. way over on okay. your head part. Okay, you so let's see here. Kennedy. Your part should be Kennedy. Is this Kennedy more Kennedy next? for you, little one? Or where's the Kennedy part here? Take pixels thing there. Braid it and put beads in it. Oh, no. No, not going to happen. Not to this boy. <laughs> yeah, Eric, large rock to powdered sugar. That's that's the, uh, the technical term is communition, making little ones out of big ones. Uh, let's see. 
<laughs> if you got a big enough mind, that could be pretty cool, Old Med. Um, of course, it would have to be safe enough everywhere so that when somebody crashes their drone, they can recover it safely. Uh, that looks pretty close to where I had it. I mean, <laughs> well, I don't. Mine's I'm, right there. I'm inching it over fraction by fraction. No, no. The idea is to put it right where you think it's supposed to be, and then we'll we'll have a vote. Okay. Well, look at me. See, Chris Fox, this is the kind of crazy stuff we do here, live from the Adobe Hovel. Now, since you're brand new here, the reason we call it the Adobe Hovel is here in Tucson, we live in an old Adobe house that... It should be condemned. Yeah, but which we really don't know how old it is because there are no records extant of when it was actually built. We it do was, know that the bathroom was built in, what, 48 the bathroom was built in 46. 46. Okay, so that's the way Eva likes my and hair. And the entire house when we moved in had like one 60 amp circuit and uh, <laughs> the wiring is from the 40s. Yeah. Yeah, Gene, um, we're working on that. Absolutely. Uh Let's see. The ways to deploy a new way to take these crush rock into powder. That would be nice. Energy is a an issue. It, it's not something that can just be done. It, it takes energy to do it. Um, see, there are plenty of ways of crushing. The owner. I, like, I like the wild look better. Okay, Aries likes the wild look better. More natural for a guy crushing rocks for a living. Long-haired hippie, ha, ha, ha. Uh, well, it's at that in-between stage right now. He never lets it get long enough so his curls look pretty. He always insists I cut it. Yeah. Um, it's at the in-between point. Yeah, Kevin, kind of like Mount Baker, except uh, I'd like to have something a little bit more portable. Uh, I've got a 200-pound-an-hour plant that's sitting in my trailer right now. Uh, but I'd love to have some at least 500 pounds an hour that was as, as portable. Uh, yeah, Leanna, she's a pretty smart chick. Um, what do you think about the, the, the hair, the part there? Uh, let's see. We got a half a house running on <laughs> 115 amp circuit. Yeah. Actually, we've got a, a 60 amp breaker is the main breaker for this house. And all the wirings from the 40s, except what he put in. Yeah, Gene, what kind of sulfides? Iron sulfide, chalcopyrite, you know, what kind of sulfides? What are the different methods of crushing? Well, first of all, let's get it, let's define the difference between crushing or breaking and pulverization. Uh, Crushing takes big rocks and turns them into little rocks, but they're still identifiably rocks. Um, a jaw crusher has one plate that moves like this, and the rock works its way down as this plate goes like this. It's crush, 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 crush. Uh, I've got some videos uh, on my RC46 crusher and stuff. Okay, Truth Seeker likes it, uh, my hair. Um, and the jaw crusher on our scale, the micro scale, is probably the only real practical um, micro scale rock breaker. There's a there's a a new one. I forget who it is. I think it's an Australian company. It has like a a cylinder that works inside a housing like this, and so it's kind of like two uh, jaw crushers, one on each side. And uh, the next thing is to get it from rock to sand or powder. On a micro scale, probably the easiest way is either an impact mill or a hammer mill. Something, you know, there's a shaft spinning at a high rate of speed and there's pieces of metal. A hammer mill and an impact mill work a little bit different. Well, actually, a hammer mill is a kind of impact mill. My impact mill is more of a paddle wheel, and uh, but 
essentially all works the same thing. You have a high speed rotor that's smacking into the rock um, and beating it into a, a powder. Um, the advantage of impact mills is they're very compact. You can get a pretty small mill that'll crush a fair amount of rock. Um, so that's port portability. Um, the negatives are it's fairly energy. It's not as if energy efficient as say a ball mill. It also has higher wear rates per ton. Uh, your, um, you're looking at like replacing or rotating wear parts every eight hours of operation, things like that. And um, you can use ball mills, rod mills. These are basically rotating cylinders with steel things in them, you know, balls, rods, whatever. And as it rotates, these things fall and, and just grind up the rock. Uh, they're very energy efficient. Uh, in large tonnages, they tend to be very big and very heavy. <laughs> so portability sucks. And uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, so they all have their pluses and minuses, as, as Chris Georgie said. Um, depends to some extent on the rock itself, how easy it breaks up, etc. For example, if you had a real, if you had like limestone, the wear rates in an impact mill would be much less than say quartzite or, or just bull quartz, you know, hard quartz vein. Um, and so this can make it a difference as to what makes the most sense for you, especially in a production setup. Uh, it's my conclusion that for a testing, a, a high mobility setup, jaw crusher, small jaw crusher for the braking, uh, and an impact mill for the pulverization, you can also use what's known as a rolls crushers for an intermediate communist from turning the, the gravel into sand. And it's just two steel rolls <laughs> that are pressed together. And the stuff comes in the top, and they roll, and they just crush it. Um, and that can can work out. Uh, in terms of what size jaw crusher to build, depends on your throughput that you want, um, and what size rock that you need to be able to feed to it. Um, quite often, the it, it makes more sense to have a, a larger jaw crusher just to take larger rocks. It's not that you need the throughput. It's just you don't want to have to be constantly breaking up the rocks to get them small enough to fit in the jaw crusher. So sometimes that's the criteria that, uh, that really decides the size of your jaw crusher. Yeah, uh, exactly, Chris. Uh, you can make a jaw crusher that has lower throughput, but has a lot greater size reduction. And sometimes that makes perfect sense. Um, if you're, you know, say you want a six by 10 jaw and your impact mill can only run, you know, 500 pounds an hour. Well, six by 10 jaw can crush a lot more than that. So if you make it so that it, it takes it down to a much smaller material before, it comes out the ends of the jaw, you're going to slow your throughput down, but you're going to reduce the wear on your impact mill dramatically because you got much smaller rocks going into it. Yes, Chris, everything is complicated. <laughs> Although as a general rule, uh, I think most of them are bottom toggles now. Um, Especially if you want to, you know, maximum size reduction, you probably go with a bottom toggle. Yeah. Uh, feeding an impact mill, you're going to want a jaw crusher first. You don't want to be throwing two inch rocks into an impact mill. Your wear rates are going to be pretty, pretty serious. 
Um, the other thing is um, you're where you know it's just so much easier to handle when you, you're not dealing with larger chunks. Hello, on tag ten. How's it going? Um, we're talking about crushing and grinding right now. Yeah, and well, depending upon what your material running secret, if you're like doing a dump, initially it may be best just to screen it uh, to like half inch or something like that, three quarter inch. Not only will that make it a lot easier to feed the impact mill and, and increase your throughput, but it will also likely give you an upgrade because the um, the gold-bearing minerals tend to be more fragile than just the bull quartz or whatever other stuff is there. And so the more mineralization, the more it tends to just grind up on its own. Summer sausage. Yeah. And therefore, um, if you do a screening, you can often upgrade it by a factor of two or three. So that also improves your efficiency. Um, Ryan's ore does about a two to one and so did Montana B. Uh, you know, we took half ounce to the ton dump and turned it to 1.3 ounce per ton, half inch minus. And that's a pretty good, uh, upgrade, especially initially. Uh, cause then, you know, you're doing more than half of, you're doubling your, your gold output while you're testing and that's a good thing um if you can't if you can't make it profitable at that then you know the original grade isn't going to work too well so did that answer the questions uh, roughly on on rock crushing and grinding uh, again they're, they're very general answers but until you have a specific rock to talk about, that's all you can get anyhow. Okay, John, I'm glad glad to help. Uh, that's what we do here. That's that's part of the purpose of the uh, um, the live streams, is so people can just ask questions and get a detailed answer, a, a comment section in the. Um, you know, on, on a video is not the best. Um, uh, yeah, there's not a lot of bandwidth there. <laughs> and the other thing is you can see if you're watching the comments, uh, Chris, Georgie, and we have other people who are also interjecting and adding information. So that's also good too. Uh, any other questions at this point? What age can you get a kid start in the industry and at what level? Well, <laughs> the two questions are thoroughly related. Um, in terms of industry, the question would be, uh, and I see your question secret, and I've got some interesting things, thoughts on that, but uh, if you're talking actual mining companies and such like that, it's usually 16 or 18 due to the safety uh, situations. And uh, so that's kind of the minimum for that. If it's talking about when can you get a kid interested in gold panning and stuff like that, man, as soon as they're, you know, old enough to hold a pan or whatever, if they, if they're interested, there's something they can do. Um, you just have to be careful. Yeah, there's Chris at five. Uh, old Med, start panning at five. Absolutely. Um, uh, if you could email me a link on that, I'd appreciate it, winging it, on this micro ultra centrifuge thing. Um, now, back to Secret Squirrel's question. About who built the pyramids and how old are they? Keep that on. I'm going to answer a couple here. Um, somebody asked one, ore grades typical of pyrite. Uh, 
it depends on the pyrite. Is it ever economical on a medium to small scale? Yes. However, quite often, what say, especially if you had like calcopyrite or something like that, you could make a concentrate and sell it to a refiner, and it's very low cost. You're going to be paying less than 10% for the refining in general because they're getting the cal copper too. Uh, you also wow. don't have to put much capital into that. On the matter of pyramids, I was just double checking myself. Dozier is the oldest one, and they estimate that it was built around 3300 BC. I think he was looking more for a personal years. opinion on that. Um, the the pyramids. Um, I forget what book I read. It was it had something to do with it. the one thing that I find really interesting is um, there's a place where they, they cored out like sarcophagi and such um, and where they would essentially take a core drill and make a bunch of cores and then break them off and that's how they would, you know, eat out the middle there. And they, you know, you can see tool marks where apparently the, the drill was advancing like a sixteenth of an inch per revolution uh, in, you know, diorite, granite, things like that. Hey, Jake, how's it going? And uh, they don't even know if they could do that nowadays using ultra, about the only thing would be an ultrasonic drill. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, Chris Fox, it gets pretty wild here sometimes. Aliens, dude. Yep. Uh, Ontag, you have lots of ore. What kind of ore and what is the grade of the ore is the question. Uh, uh, I understand that, Liana. Um, the, when do they want to get outdoors and such, too? I mean, my brother and I, my mom used to take us out picnicking when we were, you know, five and six and stuff like that. Got us really hooked on the outdoors. Um, gold panning is a good start. Um, exactly. How old are the boys, Liana? <laughs> Somebody just asked a question, Chris. What's the correlation? Somebody asked a question, so I gave him an answer. <laughs> Uh, Jake had to clean out the garage, huh? Rock hounding, yes, Chris. Very good, too. Uh, Leanna, that's a good point. Rock hounding. Geology in general. Now, my mom was a, had a master's degree in geology. So we, um, you know, we're getting a lot of that. You know, just driving down the road, you'd be looking at the road cuts and stuff. Hey, Gene. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks for everything. Um, yep. Happy to see you this time. That'd be great. Um, let's see. I thought I saw something. Okay, on tag. You need an ass air. <laughs> um, 9, 11, 16. Oh, yeah. Geology, panning, stuff like that. Sure. Where do you live? Liana, in general, what's your general area? Okay, this is the assayer I generally use. No, this is my email down here. Uh, Lawrence Hiddle in Colorado, $45 an assay, including sample prep, spire assay, and he's quick. He, tune around time, usually less than a week. And uh, you can also go to my videos on hand panning micro fine gold and potentially uh, learning uh, you know, how to, to, to recover the gold directly and, and get rough assays um, yourself real fast. Low desert in California. Yeah, there's, there's gold out in that area. Absolutely. Yeah, Lawrence Hiddle, and did you get his phone number and address and stuff? 
Um, yeah, Leanna, uh, up there in the Randsburg area, uh, they had, you know, big hard rock mines. But, yeah, there should be gold easily for, uh, you know, taking the kids out. Absolutely. Uh, on tag, um, look at uh, video 99 of mine, uh, how to pan, uh, how to hand pan microfine gold 2019. We'll give you a good, uh, um, the basics on it. It's not that hard to do. It really isn't. But a standard panning technique will not work. Not on the reveal. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I use it a lot. Um, as, and, and it, it allows me to get instant results, basically. In five minutes, I can have some kind of result. Once I've cross-correlated that with assays, I can have a pretty good guess of what the heck I'm, I'm doing there. Um, let's say real fast. It works real good in process control, especially when I'm, you know, changing things up on a, a rig that I'm testing. I can change it, boom, you know. And, and um, there's also one, I forget the video, called uh, uh, Using the Paleolithic MRI for Process Control. And basic, uh, basically what it means is you stop the process in the middle of when it's doing its thing, and then you just take the various portions of the material out and pan them separately, and you can see where the gold is going in your process. And that includes on what your losses are and, you know, is it, is it you know, being recovered fairly evenly throughout everything and you're getting some fairly significant losses or whether you're recovering it real quick, things like that. It, uh, it's super duper useful when it works. Um, the, the stuff I work down here, uh, Ryan's ore, it works really well with that technique. Uh, stuff up in Montana, not so much. That's some really, really fine gold. So uh, that's, I say, it's a very, very useful uh, technique for a lot of things. It's not definitive, although it will give you a minimum. You can say, I'm getting at least this much gold out of it. Okay. Um, okay, Robert, are we on the road yet? No, we're leaving tomorrow, 8 o'clock in the morning, roughly. Uh, go to Nephi in two days. Spend a little time there. It's going to be snowing, theoretically, on Thursday, so we'll probably hang out at Nephi until Friday and then head up north, uh, probably just driving through Pocatello because Idaho Rogers is probably not going to be there. And uh, the uh, next stop will be in Montana, just north of Dillon. We'll probably spend a couple of days there, too. Uh, thank you, Secret. I, say I'd, I like to just show everyone what I got. I'd, I thought that one was pretty close to a, a fairly recent video. Uh, Another kind of, of uh, fool's gold. That was pretty funny. Why is it so fine in Montana? Um, the area where we're at around Helena, a lot of it is associated with arsenal pyrites and such as that. And for whatever reason, when the arsenal pyrites oxidize, it leaves very, very fine gold. Um, there may be... Uh, some issues of uh, tellurides there too, uh, which would make it that much harder to recover, but not only that, but to recognize what you're looking at. Uh, Craters of the Moon, where the heck is that? Sounds familiar. 
Thank you, Robert. We, uh, we're, we're planning on it. And again, when we see bad weather coming, we're just going to pull over and hang out for a while, let it go by. Where's my little sheet here? High speed centrifuge. Craters of the Moon National Monument. Yeah, where is it? Idaho. Okay, Idaho is more than 26 miles Big across. River Plain in central Idaho, along US 20, between towns of Arco and Cary. Okay, that's that's better. Uh, for micro gold. Okay, I'll try and get that as soon as I can get a little time. Uh, now, the town of Telluride was named after the gold mine, the, the, the rock in the gold mines there. The, the, the rock had gold Tellurides, and that's where the town got its name. So, Gold alloys with just about everything. No, nah, it doesn't alloy with just about everything, but it, 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 it is associated with a number of different things. Arsenic, tellurium. Silver. Yeah. Uh, nickel. Not that I know of. It might, but I had never heard of it. I believe so. What makes uh, green gold and rose gold? I have no clue. You've got the uh, Google in front of you. And black gold, and there's blue gold too. Yep. Uh, we try, Robert. Um, we got the the camper, the minor bago. Uh, 76 Chevy with a custom built camper on it. It's bigger than a camper shell, less than a cab over. Uh, and I mean, it doesn't have the amenities that a cab over would, but I also got a utility bed, so I got lots of tools and stuff on it. Yellow gold, okay. gold, silver, copper, and zinc. Red gold is gold and copper. Uh, rose Chris, gold. it's not stupid. You're just not knowledgeable yet. And White that's, gold is gold and platinum. That's the way you you learn and yes, these things. White gold can also alloy with nickel and zinc. Yeah. Um, gold telluride, gold can actually essentially alloy with tellurium. And uh, like calaverite is roughly 60% gold uh, by weight. And the rest tellurium, and it. I think you can actually volatilize. You can in, in a furnace, it can actually vaporize, and you can lose it. So you use special fluxes, I believe, when you are uh, assaying it, etc. Um, Lawrence, he does a lot of tellurides up there in Colorado, so his flux is specifically designed and tested again that kind of like sulfides yes but in the sulfides the gold is more it's not so much alloyed as it's kind of mixed it's very fine gold particles inside the sulfides uh, it's not so much chemically bound to the sulfur uh, to my knowledge Chris Georgie correct me if I'm wrong and uh, uh, but in tellurium, it's actually essentially alloyed. It's chemically combined with the tellurium. Um, yeah, but it's similar to an alloy. It's, it's an atomic scale mixture and bonding there. Okay, on tag, assayers and labs. Okay, um, let's see. What's the, what was that? Uh, something or other global? ALS, wasn't it? Yeah, ALS. If you're looking for other laboratory analyses like multi element analysis stuff, ALS global. Um, they've got a lab in Reno. They've got a lab down here in Tucson. 
they're pretty easy to deal with. They don't have a minimum, reasonably priced. And uh, you're, it's going to take you a month to get results. Okay. And uh, so you can do that. If it's just assaying, I hope I don't get Lauren so much business that he can't do my stuff in a timely manner anymore. <laughs> Uh, so let's say ALS Global, you can Google them. Yeah, Terry, have a nice night. South London, I'm going for a Tommy. I'm not sure what that means. Do you know what that means, little one? Sounds like some kind of English term. No idea what's this content. Okay. I was looking in the eyes. I capture colloidal gold. Is there such a thing? Yes, there is such a thing as colloidal gold, although in my estimation, it's more likely uh, microfine gold as opposed to true colloidal gold. Colloidal gold will be gold in particles so fine they will not settle out ever. <laughs> Okay, a true colloid never settles, and that takes real, real small particles. Microfine gold um, can be very difficult to settle. You know, if you got five micron gold, ten micron gold, it'll probably settle eventually. But if it won't settle preferentially, in other words, it'll settle before the rest of the stuff, then you can't separate it. So it becomes extremely difficult to recover using what they call a gravity separation technique, a technique that uses the, the density differences to separate things. You can also Colloidal have... Colloidal gold conjugates with particle sizes of 10 nanometers or less cannot sediment. 10 nanometers. Is that the same as a micron? Check out what a nanometer is. It may be a micron, but I'm not sure. Um... By the way, colloidal gold would show red, blue, or purple in liquid. Yeah. Um, and you can also have dissolved gold. You can have like a gold chloride or something like that. Nanometer is a thousandth of a micron. Thousandth of a, of a micron? That's what it says. Uh, okay. Take a look. Okay. No, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing. Okay. So a, a nanometer, you know, you're talking a thousandth the size of the typical really fine gold in hard rock. <laughs> yeah, a tenth of a micron or less would be... I mean, no, it would be a thousandth. It would be like a hundred nanometers. Because a, a, a micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. Yeah. A nanometer would be a millionth of a millimeter, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Say, if it's truly colloidal, I don't think it'll settle even in a high-speed centrifuge. Anyone know for sure? Yeah. And Chris says the same thing. It's a thousandth of a micron. The smallest gold I'm recovering is down in the neighborhood of uh, 20 microns, something like that, which is getting into bacterial size. <laughs> Um, and it's quite common for me to recover 35 micron gold using gravity techniques. Yeah, uh, I can say 35 micron is, is routine for me. Well, I am not sure if it applies, but I did find an interesting paper on colloidal sedimentation and filtration. Oh, well. Um, and... If you look a couple of videos ago on my channel, there's one on microfine versus fine gold in a pan. And you can see the typical stuff I'm getting from Ryan's or, and that's reasonably easy stuff to recover for, for hard rock or, uh, if you look at some of the Montana B stuff, you'll, you'll see some things that's even substantially finer than that. Oh, 
How small does a jeweler's glass measure? Okay. Now, when I'm using a loop like this, basically a piece of gold on a black pan, when I can no longer make out any features, it's just a little speck of light, that's in the neighborhood of 35 microns or one thousandth of an inch across, okay? Now, I have a little pocket microscope that's a 30 or 40 power microscope. It has a reticle in it, and I can actually measure directly. And the smallest divisions in that reticle are one one thousandth of an inch. So, let's say that's, that's how I can tell with relative precision as to how really big the particles are. Yeah. Yep, that's exactly it, Goldstream. And that's that's where the complexity lies. <laughs> it's always nice to have something that's so rich that you can make money almost no matter how badly you screw it up. But um, <laughs> that's not usually the case, unfortunately. Uh See what other questions pop up here. So Chris Fox, see, see what we do here on live from the Adobe Hava. What do we call it when we're? I guess when we're up in uh, Helena, it'll be live from the penthouse, huh? Yeah. Yeah. We're going from an Adobe Hovel to a penthouse, people. I'm moving up in the world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The uh, the place we're staying there is it's an upper floor. Uh, motel room. It's the only one. It used to be the uh, the room for the uh, the manager, I I presume. And uh, say it's a it's an interesting hike up those steps. It's going to be fun carrying all the crap up there when we get there. All that canned food. <laughs> My legs are going to be tired. Um. Well, secret, that's usually where you find the placer gold. Um, by using placer recovery techniques in the drainages and following the gold upstream to where it suddenly drops in concentration or in the tenor, you know, like you're, you're seeing a lot of fine gold and all of a sudden you're, you're not seeing as much gold in all of its course. What that means is you're, you're pretty close to the original ore body or what you would call the mother load. And then you start what they call loaming. In other words, you're, you're, you're sampling the soil. And again, following the gold up to the actual outcropping that the gold is weathering out of. And so that's a very, very common technique for locating hard rock deposits when you have significant soil cover. Now, out in the western United States, a lot of times you can just see the bedrocks right there. There's a vein. Hey, I see it. Sample it. Um, but you go to, like, Oregon, good luck. <laughs> you know, you got soil, you got plants, you ain't going to see no bedrock there. And that's where you have to use uh, placer stream bed techniques and loaming to, re to find out where the gold's coming from. And um, Richard's mine up in, in Oregon there, it was actually a, a spring because the, the fracture that was then filled with the vein uh, is, is a break in the rock. Rainwater percolates down, gets in that crack and runs along the crack until it came out the side of the hill. And so that they found gold in the spring, and that's how they located that ore body. Let's see. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Okay, Bill, does that mean you live in Oregon? <laughs> 
let's see. No ONTOG, I do not. That doesn't mean they don't exist or they might not even be significant. I'm simply unfamiliar with them. Uh, generally, you know, if you got very little cover of the bedrock, you can find it in situ. But if you got any significant cover of the bedrock, you're not going to spot that vein very easily unless you've got high blind sight. Uh, um, unless you've got a like a durable quartz outcropping, you're not going to find that vein. And usually, the more mineralized veins are not that durable. <laughs> yeah, I've always wondered about that, uh, Aries. Running one of those drones, I think that's for, for the young whippersnappers who can think, they can take their mind and transport it to where the camera is and work with that. <laughs> yeah, well, there is gold up in Oregon too, Bill. Um, if you don't, I mean... Look up old mines, old mining districts and stuff, then find areas that are not claimed and, and explore that. And, uh, huh. Old man says, get a DJI Mini 2 sub 250 gram. They fly themselves, take 20 minutes to learn, and are $500. Wow. I want one. It's just weird. I want one. I play video games. Electrons. There's there's electrons involved. I mean, I, I was born when electrons were new. <laughs> I, 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 can, I can... Actually, I was in high school and uh, probably a junior when our math department got the first electronic calculator in the school. It was about the size of, I mean, it, it was bigger than a, than a notebook computer here, um, about twice the size and, you know, this thick. And it could add, subtract, multiply, and divide to 24 places and cost 800 bucks. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, say that was, that was new tech back then. Uh, yeah, they had radio control airplanes. Um, the difference really between drones and, and an RC aircraft is the RC aircraft has to maintain a certain minimum forward speed, whereas drones can fly in any direction. It's really amazing, you know. I remember the first ATM machine in Boston. Is, is Nick Zinter here? Robert McGuire, sourdough miner, Nick Zinter, like your knowledge, thanks. Yeah, well, Nick is a pretty smart dude. I crashed a radio plane too. Yeah, I, I'm sure I would have. I learned how to use a slide rule too. You know, the kids nowadays, what the hell is a slide rule? It's like I'm trying to teach them how to read maps, Bear. Don't tell me. I don't know if I I used to have one here. I don't see it right now. It's a uh an interesting device for those who are not familiar with it. I know people who can't read maps. <laughs> oh, there's people that can't do so much stuff nowadays because their smartphone does it all there. The common, the common Sense Database is dead. I think my stepfather had a log log duplex vector or something like that. Um, but yeah, they, they say kids nowadays. And, and the funny thing was, 
even with slide rules. I mean, they they built the SR seventy one from scratch in eighteen months using slide rules. You know, and uh, um, you know they they got to the moon designing stuff with slide rules. See. Hello, Lito. I don't think I've seen your uh, uh, handle before. Log tables, yeah, and trig tables, too. You know? Oh, I don't know how smart I am. I'm reasonably smart, yes. Reasonably knowledgeable, yeah. Am I really knowledgeable? Eh. I'm really smart. Okay, I'm I'm more humble than Eva. How's that? <laughs> Again, Lito, that doesn't that doesn't ring a bell to me, but I'm glad to see see a new name here. We like everybody. Uh yeah, kids don't know squat because they're not taught how to think anymore. They're taught not to think, but just they're indoctrinated. The but we can't talk about that or we'll get shut down. The, the, the uh, common sense database is dead. Augusta, Georgia. Well, um, there is gold in Georgia. Uh, Google it and uh, say there is some gold there. Don't know how much. Yeah, tearing tearing electronics apart usually doesn't work nowadays. Any opinion on proportions of the impact mill? Not in specific at this point. Uh, mine seems to work reasonably well, but there was a there was one that I saw not too long ago that seems to work pretty good. It was a chain mill. Mine is. It's kind of a paddle wheel design, but it's also used as a blower, um, and as to for material transport. You're welcome, on tag. Yeah, they're 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 a big company. They're all over the place. I say the nice thing is they don't have a minimum, or at least they didn't this summer. Let's see. Yeah, I say I know there's gold down in the southeast there. You got to drive a tank at five. Sweet old med. Uh, old med has all the fun. Uh, I want to drive a tank. <laughs> said it was the happiest he ever saw. I could believe that. Uh, yeah, never driven. I've driven some some pretty big equipment. I've done. Let's see. Nine ninety two C. Quarter million pounds. How much is that in tons? A lot. So get rid of those. 120. Yeah, I've driven some bit heavier than a tank. Does that count? <laughs> of course, it didn't have a gun on it. Everybody else has done cool stuff. Yeah, the a 992C has a static tipping load of 95,000 pounds. It can pick up, you know, basically a semi truck. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 125 tons. Yeah. yeah it, it comes in on like four heavyweight semis. I mean, one, one truck is just for the tires and wheels. Uh, one truck carries essentially the main frame, uh, which has the engine and the, the 
you know, the axles and everything, all that other stuff. Another one brings the bucket and the cab, <laughs> you know. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty big machine. So it's, it has a, it is 95,000 pounds static tipping load and 115,000 pounds of breakout force. So it's not hard to get the back bumper off the ground. If you can, if you can dig those teeth into the muck, <laughs> muck pile real good, yeah, you can pick up that back end and wiggle it around. No problem. I'm not sure who you're talking to, Leto. Uh, King Tut Mine. I think that's up in the Kingman area, but I'm not sure. And if so, I'm quite a ways away. I'm I'm in Tucson, Arizona, which is like seven hours from Kingman, six seven hours. Um, so I'm in Tucson. Um, Copper is a big thing around here. We got world class copper mines, you know, 15 miles down the road here. Uh, I have driven right past Ruby on the Ruby Road. I haven't gone in there as private property, so I didn't go in there. Although I do hear one of their ponds, old tailings ponds, there has got pretty good bass fishing, although you don't want to eat the bass. Um, any potential there? There's some. Uh, I don't know exactly how much. I had some claims uh, in that area at one time. Um, and how come you don't drink the, the bass? Heavy metal poisoning, mercury, for example. <laughs> exactly. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Yazi, that sounds like Navajo. Navajo or uh, pretty sure that's Navajo. Uh, that's Navajo, isn't it, Jonathan? I uh, used to work near Church Rock, New Mexico. I worked with a lot of Navajos. Uh, they called my my nickname was Nashui, uh, which also, I guess don't means never eat cattails from mine ponds. Yeah, don't eat cattails, heavy metals. Uh, yeah, yeah, I worked with a lot of Navajos, and uh, I'd say I, my nickname was Snake, um, and. Uh, um, so that, that's a Nashui, I believe means rattlesnake in Navajo, but yata hey, Jonathan. Um, so down Ruby, they did have gold. Uh, don't know how much they've got down there now, but they, yeah, there's a number of mines in that area down there, but it's all forest service and they're. Uh, you know, they're, they're hard to deal with right now. Right. Yep. Yeah, Jonathan, it was, it was interesting in Gallup. You know, it really was. Thank you, Blind Sight. Appreciate it. We'll do our best. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. Um, let's see. I think, yeah. Uh, we were actually, I think Church Rock was just off the reservation, and there was a mine across the line. Forget the name of that. And that was on the reservation. Uh, Robert, YouTube is supposed to let you know. I posted this at 2.30 in the afternoon that I was going to be up at 6. And according to Chris... It didn't give any notification until like 30 minutes before. Um, we generally try to have a, a routine time. We were, we were doing it Sunday evenings, but then I had to sell Christmas trees and fireworks, and that kind of screwed that up. And uh, we'll see once we get up to Montana if we can establish a similar routine. I like Sunday evening. It seems to be a pretty good time for everyone. People don't have trouble watching um but uh yeah we'll we'll just have to see uh aries got the notification of 5 30 that sounds 
uh, very similar to uh, what Chris said. He got it about 30 minutes ahead of time. Yeah, we're going up to a, a situation up in Montana. We were we were there this summer. Uh, oh, okay, Lito. Yeah, um, or Jonathan. I, I think it's Jonathan. But yeah, um, uh, we're going to be in Helena and working down south east of there is the plan. But. Uh, the uh, we're we're heading up there for other reasons right at the moment, but we'll probably be doing some extracting testing while it's you know still cold, and then once the snow melts and we can get into the mine, we'll start doing some other sampling and such. Uh, if you look at my past videos, Montana Prospect B is the initial target. Oh well, thank you for your service, uh, Lito. And excuse me if I'm rude, uh, Lito, but I can't remember names very well at all. Say, so I think you said your name was Jonathan, but and I say I just I Lito and Chris and Aries, and <laughs> that's how I do it because I can see what's going on. Um, I'm sixty, almost sixty-five. Uh, what is it now? About it's about a month. Thirty-eight days, thirty-nine days, something like that. Um, and uh, a month and five days. Yeah, and uh, then I'll be sixty-five. And uh, I've had a stroke, so I blame everything on the right parietal lesion. Although I was terrible with names and faces before. The <laughs> but I, when you got an excuse, use it, man. What good is an excuse that you don't use? Uh, <laughs> so it's always the right parietal lesion. Absolutely. Uh, hey, smoking! Happy birthday in two days. Happy birthday! And uh, yep. Well, Eva looks fantastic. I just look amazing. <laughs> I do not look fantastic. You're blind as a bat. Uh, no, that's not it. I'm blinded by love, little one. Uh, yeah, winging it. Keep trying. You'll never catch up to me. <laughs> you mentor in preclinical pre neuroscience, huh, old med? Man, you're another um, renaissance man, huh? A polymath. Yes, she does. Yeah, pretty much, Chris. It, it's unfortunate. It, it, it occasionally happens, Lito. But yeah, it's, it, it must be even worse for a, for a lady than for a guy. You know? What? Well, thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate that. Did you, did you see the last video? Um, on the difference in uh, gold, you know, between micro fine and just fine gold in the pan, you might find that uh, very useful. Um, Jonathan Yazzi here says he sluiced 11 grams of fine gold, 200 mesh. He learned to pan from my video. Yay! Yay! Woohoo! Yeah, I mean, that that's what makes it really worthwhile. Uh, you just made Bear's Day for the next month, Jonathan Yazi. Yeah, it, it, it it's really rewarding when when somebody can sit there and say, "Hey, you know, the, your information made a difference, a positive difference in my life." You know, um, that's that's really really rewarding. Um, as you can probably tell, I don't worry too much about money and i worry about experience um even i love to travel um i'm sure i could have made a lot more money in my life if i'd focused on making money but that's not my focus and uh, uh 
I just try and do the right thing. Sometimes it's real easy. Sometimes it's not so much. But uh, one thing that really helps is I don't want to lose her respect. And that gives me strength at times. Also, if she needs something, that also gives me strength. Yeah, um, Lido, the, it, it, you know, in, in Gallup, there was a real alcohol issue. Um, I mean, I've almost run over someone who was drunk in the middle of the road. I mean, laying down in the middle of the, the highway, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's a shame. Um, just it, it's it's a real shame um, that one luckily he rolled over just you know I thought I thought it was just trash in the middle of the lane he was laying lengthwise and then he just rolled over and I saw his arm flop over and it's like <laughs> you know and um, to give you an idea how routine it was I, I stopped I'm like there's this guy drunk in the middle of the road what do I do? And I mean, it wasn't a minute. And some pickup pulls up, you know, a bunch of uh, Native Americans in it. And they go, eh. and they just pick him up, throw him in the back of the truck, and they'll take care of him. It's, wow. And it just, uh, yeah, let's say that, that that whole area there, it's, it's pretty weird. So you just, you know, deal with it. Also, they, the reservation is essentially a separate nation. And so, st you know, police can't go onto it without their permission. So vehicles would be stolen, things like that. There's really not much you could do. Yeah. Uh, i say it's pretty endemic in a lot of the, uh, the Native American communities. And I, I don't have a solution you know uh, how would I extract micro gold well that would depend upon how micro and what the matrix is if it's in the neighborhood of uh, 50 micron and larger and it can be freed up it's free milling gold um, I'd use a gravity technique I've got a concentrator I'm working on that seems to work pretty well, but you could use, uh, there's some separation tables that will do that. And um, there's a, you know, once you start getting below that 35 micron range, somewhere in there you, you run into the thing where it's, it's just too fine to gravity extract. Then you're looking at leaching, potentially flotation, things like that. So the first thing you'll need to do, uh, Jonathan, is figure out what the size of the gold particles are and um, what the matrix is. How easy is it to break it away from the matrix when you grind it? And um, it requires some testing to do that. Um, as a general rule, I can run through an impact mill if I can hand pan the gold uh, with using my microfine technique and get good recoveries. Gravity recovery should be fine. Up in Montana, that stuff's too fine. It's not working real well on the gravity. Uh, I've improved the concentrator some, and we'll see whether that gets me in the range where it may be useful but you know right now i'm at 20 percent recovery and it's got to be better than 50 before i'll even start thinking i'm being successful there um, um, hmm. No, I've not done any uh, research on the Superstition Mountains. It's not in my neck of the woods. It's up there by Phoenix. And uh, so I haven't really... 
Um, I can separate sand and iron very well now. Not gold, but I can separate anything. Hmm. Interesting, Bill. Keep us informed on that. What's so startling, Chris? I'm looking at the thing and I, I don't see too much. <laughs> Horribly unusual here. Although the Native American discussion was some night. We haven't one, had one of those before. Uh, but uh, Jonathan, uh, was that helpful? And to, to visualize the size of the gold, you can buy a little pen microscope with a, uh, a reticle in it. So you can just look at it and measure it that way. Hey, Lars, how's it going? Hi, Lars. Happy New Year. <laughs> um, Electrum is just a natural alloy of gold and silver. It means there's more silver than usual in your area. Um, aside from that, I'm not uh, terribly familiar with how the mineralogy of that would work. Happy New Year's, Lars. Yeah, I break for better. They're, they're real good at plastering, uh, you know, using dry washers and, and metal detectors. They're very good at that stuff. Um, try to buy fossils at the Rock and Gem Show, but not in uh, not in the natural formations around here that I'm uh, aware of. Uh, this is primarily igneous, metamorphic. Um, I believe not a whole lot of sedimentary. Trilobites and ammonites in the uh, Tularosa Basin up around Ruidoso in New Mexico. That's one place I know of that has a lot of those types of fossils. Yeah, yeah, I say, but we don't have much sedimentary stuff here in Tucson. You get in the northern Arizona, there's it's all sedimentary, primarily sandstones, but there's limestones there too. Uh, I think the Moencope is a is a limestone formation. Um, but yeah, there's not much in the way of fossils around Tucson here. They have found Electrum, by the way, in Telluride, Colorado. Uh, probably number two, Lars. That's my guess. There could have been Ignoramus, too. You know, it's just one of them Ig words. Oh, if you go a ways back, um, quite a bit has been eroded. I mean, this is the basin and range complex. And uh, the sediments in the basins here are, you know, thousands of feet thick, you know, one to 2,000 feet thick. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a lot of erosion. Yeah, so if you just Google Basin and Range Complex, I think it's also the Cordillera, the Western Cordillera. But uh, Basin and Range is is that's what we got around here. Yeah, 
basically the, the, the Earth's crust kind of stretched and faulted and then blocks dropped, leaving, you know, mountain ranges up here and basins down there and then erosion filled in the basins. And so you have these, uh, they call them uh, sky islands, you know, these mountain ranges, because the, the ecology, the ecological niches on top of the mountains are separated from each other by totally different ecology in the basins. And so uh, you have, uh, say, like the squirrels, you know, different mountains have different species of squirrels on them just from, uh, I'm, Chris, I think I actually got you here. Yes, it's Horst and Graben, but I believe it's G-R-A-B-E-N. It's a uh, uh, perch and something uh, that's German. <laughs> no, no, no. The air conditioning didn't blow away all the topsoil. It's water erosion. We get some bodacious gully washers in the summer here. Yep. <laughs> hey, smoking as long as it works out in the end, huh? Uh, I've seen some down there by Aravaca, you know, uh, the, the king snakes. Well, you can claim to spell, Chris, but that doesn't mean you can back up the claim. <laughs> Near Ruby, yeah, a little bit north of Ruby there, but the, the Ruby area um, should have some. I used to have some claims down near Aravaca, so I drove that road a lot. <laughs> you spell correct or can't spell. Well, it's not programmed the right language, you know. Yeah, they are pretty. Although I I, I like a, a scarlet king snake better, you know. Those are really pretty. Damn, something's a little out of whack in my spine there. Ouch. Mm. <laughs> Worst when I try turning on auto corrupt, huh? Yeah. Uh, little one? Yes. Could you bring me my uh, shake from the fridge, please, when you come back? I certainly will there. Did the video load? You could set That's... me a timer for 12 minutes. Let's see, smoking. Uh. It's not loaded yet, but it may not be loading when I'm not looking at it. <laughs> That's just crazy stuff, man. Hey, Viva, jump on your back. Um, jump, no. She she could probably step on it. but Can uh, you set me a timer for 12 minutes, please? Oh, 12 minutes? Yes. I don't know. She's making hard-boiled eggs for the trip tomorrow. Let's see. I got a 10-minute timer. Will that work? That'll work. Okay. It's timing. Okay. Yeah, scarlets are beautiful. Scarlet king snakes. And they're pretty. Protein shake. Uh. I got a protein shake too. Dessert buns with black sesame inside. Well, that sounds good. 
sounds interesting. Although I'm on a low carbohydrate diet to support my mom, uh, my wife here. Yeah, I was going to say, wait a minute, your mom? Hard boiled eggs and beans. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather have the snakes, Jonathan, <laughs> than the bears. A lot safer. Um, yeah, Chris, so uh, we've got, mm, I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 quarts of canned stuff underneath the bed in the minor bagel right now to make sure it doesn't freeze. We got uh, hamburger chili, uh, chicken chili, uh, chicken breast in, in uh, broth. Uh, chicken, parmesan, uh, meatballs, and marinara. <laughs> We're not going to starve, that's for sure. I left you morning on eggs for breakfast. Lima beans with ham hocks and onions. Oh, that sounds good. Beans with ham hocks and onions. Five or six rattlers around your mind, man. They're pretty prolific there. I usually only get one or two. Well, that one time we, we hit those four at once in the uh, in the backbone. It was really good for the video. The ten most dangerous things in mines or whatever. Yeah, works great. Yes, uh, trying to mine in California is not the easiest thing, believe me. Okay. Another thing, for those of you who do live around rattlesnakes and stuff, if you have a dog, you can have it trained to not only avoid the snake, but to alert on the snakes. So it not only protects the dog, but it protects you too. And uh, uh, that's you know, very, very useful because if a, if a dog hasn't been trained, it'll tend to go try and sniff the snake, and that's bad on the dog because they'll usually get bit in the face. Yeah, uh, same thing. Yeah, you, you want them trained. Now, I understand that it's pr fairly easy to do. It's only like 50 bucks. A Dean Mini Max, is that the uh, the impact mill, or is that a uh, Mini Max? Is that a high banker? Not sure, Jonathan. Blacktail, yeah, um, yeah, I think that's what they're called down here. They're kind of a greenish cast, but they got a, a black tail on them. I think that's what they're called. I like Mojaves. And uh, Jonathan. I would suggest you use my panning technique to test your tailings, too, if you're not already, to see if you're missing anything. And uh, then, you know, because you might be recovering a, a high percentage or a low percentage, just if you're recovering. But I would definitely make sure you test your tailings. Because... Without doing that, you can't tell what your recovery is. Thank you, Robert. We'll do our best. Well, Chris, it looks like you're having fun your first day. <laughs> A lot of the action is in the comments section. Yeah, because we got some serious genius people in our comments section. 
Heloderma suspectum. Uh, is that the Mexican beaded lizard or the uh, Gila monster? I'm kind of thinking Mexican beaded lizard, but I'm not sure. Gila monster, okay. Gila monsters are toxic, I think. Yes, they are. I want one. Actually, I want a Komodo dragon, but you won't let me have one. Gila monster. Really, I thought the Heridium was the um, the Gila monster, and the other was the Vita lizard. But oh well, not a problem. Uh, it was funny. I was working. A, it was a tile job down there in Green Valley. <laughs> Some people came to the house to with the people that we were, you know, at, and it's like you know, his mother found a Gila monster in my garage. <laughs> you know. people <laughs> yeah Aries I can see that I want one no we're not taking the cats with us they're gonna be staying here with Tom and uh, we'll as I say, we're playing it by ear if the situation justifies it we may come back down here grab some more stuff and kind of move up to Montana permanently. If it doesn't, we may commute back and forth. We'll just see. If I never see another cactus, I'll be happy. For those of you who don't know, both the Gila monster and the Mexican beaded lizard, which are very closely related, the teeth are not in the jaw. They're just kind of socketed in the jumps. So if it bites you, it's going to bite. It's going to clamp and hold on and start chewing the venom in. You can just grab that sucker and rip it off. It'll just pull the teeth right out of it. But uh, <laughs> Why would you do that to a lizard? Because it's trying to injure you, and it can do so. It's grinding poison into you. You just don't know how to handle this. The first thing I would try would be just, you know, like if it's on your hand, just set it on the ground and see if it'll let loose so it can wander off. That works pretty well on things like um, oh, desert spiny skink. The first thing you do is hypnotize them and then they don't bite you in the first place. The first thing I do is leave them alone. Because uh, I got no uh, no desire to uh, get injured or to hurt it. I don't want to harm the poor thing, you know. I like lizards. Yeah, Jonathan, I can understand that. Um, I... I used to live in northern Washington, and it was weird when the nights were so long. And you up being in Alaska, it's going to be a lot worse. Didn't bother me. My friend Gonzo, he almost committed suicide. I mean, it was really rough on him. Yeah. Oh, yucca, huh? Eva's kind of allergic to... Uh, Oh, what do you call it? Choya. Uh, Lars, I wouldn't shoot a Gila monster. There you go, little one. Your eggs are done. There's no reason to shoot a Gila monster. Yeah, they, they don't move very fast. They're not aggressive. If you uh, if you leave him alone, he's not gonna he's not gonna attack you. Uh, Lido. Let's see if I can control C. Uh, control B. Okay. 
Your next memory is well, there. We're trying to do it this. Might be a small that one, one you just gave me there. Right. Let's see. Oh, that's cool. Uh, is that a, what do you call it? Goana? What? Right there, little one. Oh, I want one. I think that's a goana. Oh, he's beautiful. Hey, what's going on, everyone? I'm hanging out with Joseph the Mink Man. I'm okay, I got. I want one. I got the video. He's beautiful. Well, you're welcome, Chris. I say we uh we try. Prickly pear. Yeah, the problem with the prickly pears those little teeny uh spines. Just you can't get them out. The hair spines. <laughs> I never see another cactus. I'll be happy. Oh yeah, Bill. Yeah, it, it would be ugly, but you need to you need to get keep that venom out of you. You know. No, it's not like they're going to attack you. It's not like spiders. Yeah, I, it, it's a monitor. Yeah, a goanna is a kind of monitor, but I say I don't know. That is a beautiful lizard. I want one. But anyhow. I'll I'll look at it when I'm done with the thing here. It's I've, I've got it on another tab. Yeah, smoking. I can imagine. Uh, poke face. It it depends on where. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know it's a it's an Australian term, but it's also a particular kind of Australian monitor, I believe, a parente monitor. Where are they from? I ran fifteen to twenty mile per hour. Not sure when the last time I ran that fast, if ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you want to know what fun is? The Sidewinders uh, is the fastest snake in North America. It can do 7.2 miles an hour going forward, which is about how much I can do going backwards, trust me. <laughs> um, and they're fairly aggressive. Sidewinders are pretty aggressive. Um. The uh, the Mojave Greens are pretty aggressive too, but they're not nearly as fast as the Sidewinder. I have actually been chased by a Sidewinder before. It was uh, at night. <laughs> uh, I just keep a walking stick with me, Aries. Um, and... Uh, if you see that one uh, video I did uh, about a year and a half ago, I think now, uh, with uh, Anders, uh, Adventure at the Good Enough, we ran into a uh, a rattlesnake, which is kind of cool because, you know, he's from Sweden, so he's never seen a rattlesnake. But it was so funny because it was really brushy there. I you know we were just hiking up from one spot. Uh, portal to another, and I stuck a. Um, I think I was. I had a shovel, but anyhow, I just stuck it in the bush, and it rattled at me, and everything backed up, and I'm trying to find it. And so, I wanted to get it out where we could see it because it was just hiding in the bush there, and everything. So I told uh, Gonzo, you know, I was going to try and kind of get it in his direction there, and. Anders was so funny. He said, in Sweden, we only have 10 million people. It's not good for, you know, we, you have many more Americans. You know, you shouldn't <laughs> risk me. <You> know? <laughs> oh, that was hilarious, man. I loved it. Uh... <laughs> yeah, uh, sidewinders are... They're uh, annoying because they are aggressive. Uh.
Uh, I really want to own a sharp ATV. Yeah, I I thought that was hilarious. Anders was it just cracked me up. He was it was so fun taking him out because to to him, it's like the Wild West, you know, compared to Sweden, and we we had guns and all this other stuff, and yeah, it was it just really made his year sort of thing, which was so cool. Especially I let him drive the the minor bago, um, and he. Uh, you know, he'd never driven anything that big before. It was, it was just on a dirt road at the point where I let him drive it, you know. I mean, just an ordinary dirt road. It wasn't graded, but, you know, it's not even like a Jeep trail or anything. And he's like, uh, you know, it was, he'd never done anything like that before. It was so cool. Um, uh, never saw a sidewinder down there. You're not going to see them in most of Arizona. It has to be sandy before you can uh, sidewinders. Um, they they do not do anything but sand. They're specifically adapted to it, and that's it. And they will bury themselves in it too. So whenever you see a circular disturbance in the sand, yeah, it may be a sidewinder. Roadrunners are cool. <laughs> yeah, that would have been interesting. It would have been something he could have handled, but it would have been, you know, exciting for him. Uh, <laughs> Old Med, my grandpa came from England to become a cowboy. He became an electrical foreman in mining. <laughs> my father was a cowboy. When yeah, the sidewinder I saw was in Yuma, you know, and uh, we were out at night. I think we were scorpion hunting, but anyhow, we were out at uh, we were out at night. Scorpions fluoresce. Yep. Hunting with a black light. My father was a cowboy. Yes, we go live regularly. Uh, I typically try and do it once a week on Sunday evenings. We'll be traveling this week, so I have no idea exactly what we're going to be doing, but probably in two weeks from now. We'll have another live stream on Sunday night. Um, so if you can think of any mining questions, write them down. So yeah. you can ask them on the live stream. Or you can also email there. He loves to get email. Yeah, scorpions are pretty cool, Lito. Uh, been stung by a big desert hairy one time. And it was a little painful. I mean, you know, like bee sting sort of painful. But boy... And my lips started tingling, and then my feet started itching something terrible. Oh, my God, it was horrible. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, rattlesnake, I never, regular rattlesnakes, I've never seen an aggressive one. Um, but... Sidewinders, yes. And uh, the Mojave Greens are supposedly quite aggressive, too. Uh, Centroides sculpturatus. I think so. <laughs> uh, tarantulas are cool. No, Eva they are not. Does not like arachnids. Okay, period. End of story. However, one time, uh, I we were we were waiting for a space to set the trailer out 
there at Walmart, yeah. weren't we? Yeah. And a tarantula was wandering around over in the parking lot and didn't want it to get hurt, so I picked it up and carried it to safety. But when uh, I uh, um, took it in her general vicinity, you know, I stayed eight or ten feet away, you know, but she was like freaking out because I had it on my hand. Yeah, he's leaving out a few salient details. This tarantula was so big that we could see it crawling on the wall of the Walmart next to the soda machine 50 feet away. And this yo-yo <laughs> goes over there and gets it crawling on his anatomy. And then he brings it over, and there's this other lady in the parking lot, too, who's freaking out, by the way. I was not freaking out. She was seriously freaking out. And he's totally socially unaware, of course, and he's like, Look, it, it's not going to hurt you at all. See, and this thing's crawling all over him. And I'm like, he knows by now. All spiders in the world are in a general conspiracy. Their number one goal is to assassinate me. Yeah, well, so obviously he wants me to die. Oh, by the way, on the ratfish uh, thing, did you try putting your hand in very hot water? Because uh, most of the... Marine toxins or, or protein poisons in there denatured by a uh, high temperature. And uh, so if you just put that hand in really hot water, it may very well uh, get rid of it really quick. Uh, I saw that once with a, uh, a stingray sting. Somebody stepped on a stingray and it was hurting for like an hour or so. And then the lifeguards said, no, oh, bring her over here. And we, Stuck her foot in uh, hot water, and within five minutes, it was better. Your wife makes toadfish soup, huh? Hmm. What the heck's a toadfish? Uh, it's a toxic fish, but, I mean, oh, it's got toxic okay. spines. Uh, it's not as bad as a rockfish, but similar family, I believe. Okay. So people like deep poisonous soup. Got it. One of the huge mouthfuls of teeth. Yeah, they're 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 ugly things. Well, a lot of the rockfish are ugly. Delicacy in, in China, huh? <laughs> a lot of rockfish are ugly in general. Yeah, yeah, they're usually not the the prettiest of fishes. Sculpin and such. Now halibut are beautiful. Uh Uh, <laughs> Revenge is a dish best served with lemon and capers. I don't know about that. Maybe a burgundy sauce would be good. Revenge is like fine wine. It should be allowed to age until it reaches perfection. Uh... Everybody knows this. Sheep's head? I don't know. Um, yeah, what were they? It's a, it's a toxic fish. Sculpin. Sculpin are pretty tasty. You know? Yeah, they, they got spines on them, though. You got to be careful. They will, uh, they will hurt if you get spined. Channel cat? Eh. Not to me. Freshwater Trout, fish are not that good. Not, not bad. Salmon, not bad. Actually, uh, oh, what do you call them again? Oh, my God. My brain. The little sharks we see. Dogfish. Dogfish, yeah. Dogfish are just fine. They're easy to catch up there in the Pacific Northwest in August. It's, it's, they're spawning. They come in. And man, they, you can catch them easy. The immature males are the best. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're having a good time, old man.
Can I find golden fish? Not to my knowledge. Seal oil. Now, what do you use the seal oil? You, you cook it in the seal oil? Is that it, Jonathan? No, I'm not going to even try Stinky Flipper. I know what Stinky Flipper is. What's Stinky Flipper? Rotten Flipper. Oh, okay. So so it's kind of like, uh, oh, what do they call that stuff? Garum? Garum? Yeah, it's kind of like garum for the Latin, for the Romans, and uh, there's a variety that they make over in the Cambodian Peninsula, you know, over in the Orient, where you take a whole bunch of fish parts and you, like, yeah. um, so putrefy them. Jonathan, you, you drink the seal oil. And it's it's flavorful in and of itself. What do, what does it taste like? And Chris is going. Oh, garum is actually good. Well, yeah, well, garum from all I have read probably would taste quite good. Well, the uh, over in Sweden they do the same thing. It's it's some kind of rotten fish concoction. Um. Um. Wake up, huh? It tastes like sheep intestines that Navajos cook back home. Well, that doesn't sound very good. <laughs> Navajo chitlins, huh? Wow. Or buried sheep head in the ground in Iceland. <laughs> I tell you what, it's amazing what people eat wherever. You know? Kimchi. Yeah, at least it's not protein. <laughs> it's just vegetable. Yeah, blashan, I believe is what it's called. It's a it's a uh, fermented fish shrimp paste from Malaysia. <laughs> really ridiculous stuff. <laughs> I ate fried worms. Remember everybody? I ate fried worms. Steamers? Or is that supposed to mean steamers? A lot of stuff died out at about that time. Entirely possible from overhunting, yeah. Clean out cuisine night. <laughs> hey, I... Whatever Klingon, works. Klingon cuisine sounds interesting, but I don't know. We do what we can here. So this is live from the Adobe Hovel. I, you never know. I that. like... I, I want to try cricket flour. Gambut is another food the natives eat up here. It's something they pry off the rocks at the beach. And you mean like a, some kind of a, a seaweed type of material? Maybe barnacles. There are some barnacles that are edible. So the clovis killed the golden goose, huh? Uh, might have been the Canada goose. Who knows? Limpets, maybe. Okay, yeah, that's a possibility. Well, there are some barnacles that are that are edible. Yeah, barnacles, limpets. Like a barnacle, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 there's gooseneck barnacles and there's limpets. Yeah, there's a number of things. Can you fix the trail to your claim on BLM land? Probably uh, you'd want to talk to your local BLM office and see whether they have an issue with that, um, depending upon exactly what they're looking to do with that land. If it's like uh, under um, consideration for wilderness or something, they might not be very happy with that concept. Uh, but as a general rule, it shouldn't be a problem. But you do want to check first and make sure you get the permission in writing. Well, 
Well, if you're doing something really small, you can probably get away with just doing it. Yeah, well, that's I say it's it's hard to tell. And there's there's the other philosophy is it's uh, it's often easier to get uh, forgiveness than permission, and often it's easier to just if it's really mild, just do it and hope it doesn't get noticed because you got BLM people actually walking out there looking at it. You know. I'm kind of guessing it's not a maintained trail, Chris, from his description. But again, if he's got a legitimate claim and it's just a trail, it probably wouldn't be a problem. But, we, you know, you just want to cover your ass. Jelly sandwiches, Parmesan cheese. Yeah, I don't know. I, I did find out because uh, trying to eat low carb and so... I had low carb tortillas with me out there. I mean, when I was selling the fireworks, if I got to bring it in every night and then take it back out in the morning, that's about three or four hours of work. So I just sleep out there. And so I had uh, low carb tortillas and peanut butter and no sugar added jelly. And then I found out, you know, I also brought some bacon with me so I could make bacon and eggs for breakfast and stuff because I had the, uh, um, Minor bago with me. Uh, Lito, just for f four days, just for uh, New Year's this year, there's a guy, I for decades I've been doing kettle corn at special events and stuff. And uh, one of the guys I do special events with, other does some other things. Uh, so if I run a Christmas tree lot, a fireworks lot in December, I can make some good money. So that's what I, you know, that's what I was doing. Um, but so I made peanut butter, jelly, and then I put bacon, you know, cooked bacon on top of that first. Oh, that tasted real good. Peanut butter, bacon, and jelly. Sweet. Yep. Should I buy gold PRBTC? Not sure exactly what PRBTC means. Gold or Bitcoin, I believe he's asking. Oh, that could Bitcoin be Bitcoin is, is more my specialty. Uh, Actually, I would be buying quite a lot of silver right now because silver is going up and it's... a even now, it's still more available than gold coins where we are. There have been no gold coins in the stores for forever. But you can still get melt silver occasionally. As to Bitcoin, I would not go all in on it personally. I mean, I do intend on starting to collect it again in small amounts after we have moved. But it does not have a solid foundation behind it. And... Um, there are other coins that have just as much potential like Ethereum and Litecoin as Bitcoin has. And if you're going to buy silver, um, probably the best thing is to buy junk silver coins if you can find them. You know, pre-1965 U.S. silver coins, they're real easy to exchange. They're very, very fungible because everyone knows exactly what they're worth. I have no idea who Kathy Wood is. <laughs> what about silver? The problem with a silver round or something like that is um, Joe Schmuck doesn't know what it's worth. You know, it may say 99.999, but how do they know it's silver? You know, whereas an, an old dime, it's easy. It's also, you know, small quantities, is, it's pretty cheap. That's why I prefer the U.S. junk silver coins. Um, and as I say, when you've got ingots and stuff like that, it's a little less, less fungible, although there's not a huge problem with it as long as it's actually stamped 
you know, refined and stamped by a, a you know, a reputable uh, coin maker, <laughs> whatever. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree with Chris. Well, well said. Well known Mark silver rounds are okay, but not as easy to trade as minted coinage. Yep. I like junk silver dimes and quarters, especially if you have an, a, uh, a barter economy. If things go all to hell, uh, that'd be a lot better, uh, especially if your silver is in large quantities like one ounce or something. That's much better to have it smaller. It's already gone up from in the last few years from about eight or nine dollars an ounce to like twenty some dollars an ounce. I'd say that's pretty good already. <laughs> that's pretty bad, Lido. Uh, yes, Jeff, that's exactly why we're leaving now. It could be a very interesting week, and we would rather be the hell out of this area when it gets interesting. Sun Tzu, people, choose your battleground. You know? Yeah, we'll, we'll do our, our best to be careful and cautious and everything. We'll know a lot by tomorrow night. We'll know exactly how well the Bagos take in the heavy grades. That's the only thing I'm really worried about. General pattern for blast holes. Do you need open holes for propagate fracturing? As a gen um, generally, no. Now, if you've got a, are, are you advancing into a face on a tunnel or are you open pitting or whatever? You do need to have some kind of relief for the holes. And sometimes for the burn, you'll drill some empty holes just so the first few heavily loaded holes have something to shatter to. But as a general rule, once you've got the burn out of the way, then the rest of it, no, you don't, don't need any empty holes to give you expansion for that. Um, but if you're open pitting, no, you just, you have to shoot to an open face. In a tunnel, sometimes you got to create that open hole in the middle, and sometimes empty holes in the middle of your burn will, will help that. Um, Yes, my wife is smart. Um, it also depends on how hard the rock is as to how much you need to uh, uh, work on, on your burn. We're in Tucson, Arizona, which has a liberal progressive mayor, city council, and police chief. We are surrounded by <laughs> functional psychotics. Not a good thing. Yep. Um, and not sure what LTC means, Chris. Any idea, little one? Litecoin. Oh, Litecoin? Okay. Litecoin, I think, has potential. The reason I like Ethereum is because people are beginning Rainmaker, to I don't usually find nuggets because I'm doing hard rock. So my typical... Gold particle size is measured in thousandths of an inch. Uh, the biggest day I've done is about two grams uh, of microfine gold from hard rock. Uh, that's correct, Lito. Uh, we're headed up to Montana where we feel the situation will be uh, a lot more tenable if there's uh, societal dislocations. We have to be careful what we say so we don't get dinged, you know. And uh, yeah, I think Leto missed your show and tell. <laughs> yeah, functional. Did she say functional? I'm not sure. Yes, I said functional psychotics. At okay. the moment, they are still functional. You might like Georgia. Yeah, it's far farther away though, but. And uh, we don't have some, I mean, I'm going to a place, there's there's accommodations waiting and a job waiting. And some interesting stuff to do come on uh, 
summer at least, and hopefully before then too. Uh, do you think lead will go up? Yeah, maybe, but I don't know if it's going to go up that much to where you're going to make a lot of money. Uh, well, the Chris, I think she means Chris lot. Georgie on that one. Uh, the portable variety of lead has gone up an awful lot lately when you can find it. Yeah, but I mean, how much is it to begin with? Yeah. $5 a pound to $10 a pound to make a thousand bucks. You need a lot of money. I think he was talking about the other kind of lead. Uh, Never hurts to collect it. Yeah, 62 cents a pound right now. Hey, Forrest, how's it going? Hi, Forrest. Happy New Year. Yeah, I understand, Lito. Uh, yeah, the uh, the gentleman who uh, had me working for him this summer doing some uh, consulting uh, has some, you know, the, the, the project still needs to continue. Uh, we were planning on starting it later this spring, but external circumstances made it look uh, prudent to move earlier. So I said, that's why we're heading up to Montana here. And say so normally we would have left if there was no other considerations, probably the tenth or fifteenth, something like that. And uh, you know, but we we want to be, you know, in mid Utah by the sixth, because <laughs> who knows what's going to happen after that. The twentieth is going to be. I didn't grow up in a travel trailer, but I've I've spent years in tra trailers and, and mobile homes and I spent many summers in a travel trailer uh, traveling the country my mom loved to travel and she was a teacher so summer vacations we were rolling but uh, the minor bago was specifically designed to get out in the middle of nowhere and still be relatively comfortable to live in um, and so, yeah, Forrest, you can't stand your ground where you go to jail for standing your ground, though. That's the problem. We need to withdraw to a defensible position from which to launch the uh, Forrest counter. Forrest Sun Tzu says to choose your battleground wisely because it's half the victory. There are nine battlegrounds, and this is one of the worst kinds. No, no. Not a good place. Um, you know, I have to be careful how I say this, because who knows what YouTube's going to do, but let's say that there have been some serious questions raised as to the validity of certain things. And uh, because of that, uh, I suspect there's going to be some serious disagreements here shortly. Not to mention serious economic dislocations along with everything else. You don't think your Wi-Fi will make it to my... Why not, Lars? <laughs> Hello, Adam. Uh, how do you tell the difference between lead and iron? I don't know, but I'd love, love to hear that one. And uh, as I said, so basically that's it. We're just withdrawing to a more defensible position. Yeah, that's kind of our thoughts, smoking, joking. I mean, we're old geezers. Um, and uh, Eva's really good with the pen, and I'm kind of old for the sword, so we'll uh, we'll see what we do here. But let's see. Okay, there's another one from Leto here. Let's Control C. I'll see what I can do on that. Let's the last one didn't load pretty quick. Let's see. What state are you in? Tucson, Arizona is where we're at. And let 
control V. So let's Everyone see. Everyone in the room doesn't need to know that you're carrying. Let's see. All I did was sniff around the edges to get them. Okay, I've got that one loaded too. It seems to be working. So I'll look at that when we're done here. Say, we don't intend to run per se, as we're just picking our battlefield for us. And, and I understand completely. Um, say, we, sh we should be in a uh, pretty good case. We'll be in a pretty good situation smoking. The, uh, the surroundings are <laughs> blood red and... Uh, and say we'll have a nice uh, accommodations. Nothing's fantastic, but uh, it's uh, perfectly serviceable. And we have contacts there and things to do. So not a big problem. And yeah, I understand Forrest. Uh, I talked to, to someone I know very well, and he basically said, nah, I'm not running. As long as I take two or three of them with me, that'll work. Work it up. He's older than I am, you know. Yeah, but he also doesn't have, you know. I say where we're at, Forrest, it, it would be untenable. It'd be like those that couple in St. Louis, you know, clearly self-defense, and yet who is it that's being brought up on charges? You know, that's ridiculous. Oh, in St. Louis, yeah, there's a situation that uh, happened months ago where a, a Black Lives Matter protest or whatever broke down a gate to a gated community and, and were, were supposedly threatening a, a, a couple in their house. Uh, they said that they were threatening to kill them and stuff, and so they pointed their guns at them and told them to stay the hell off their property. And so the, the couple that was being terrorized by a couple of hundred demonstrators, they were brought up on charges. The demonstrators were let go, you know? Okay, I'll keep it as say, if we need help, we'll let everyone know. It's really nice to have the support thing. It really, really, really. Uh, yeah, poke a face, it could be. Uh, yeah, on tag, that is um, a bit of an understatement. A private uh, review of the list showed a 53.8% error rate. 53%. That's uh, more than sufficient to throw things into total doubt. So, yeah. Uh, Tell him to look up Bobby Python, P I T O N. On yeah, YouTube. that's okay. You Leto, yep, yeah, you're right. Tuesday's going to be amazing. Uh, I don't know about good times, Poker Face, but they're sure interesting times. So. Anyhow, that's the situation that's kind of driving the uh, the motivation here <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> and uh, it's an unusual feeling knowing we may not be able to come back uh, safely in any reasonable time. But, uh, you know, you do what you got to do and don't worry about it. Uh, you should control your things. Your things should not control you. Um, yeah, pretty much smoking. Only we're mobile, too. <laughs> yeah, that's the important thing, uh, Forrest, is that sheriff and your prosecutors... Um, no, 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 that's not it, Leto. Um, it's, it's not 
skin color, it's the politics. That's that's the thing. I mean, uh, I say in Tucson. Yeah, Robert. Um, good night. Um, it's it's say it's pure politics. And uh, communism. Yeah, I say the uh, the revolutionaries have taken over the local government, so you don't have a chance at a fair shake. And that's that's it, Adam. That's kind of what we're going. Yeah, I understand that, Aries. Possibly old med. That's certainly not a good thing. Agreed on tag. Agreed, smoking. You can't you can't speak your mind anymore, and that tells you all you need to know. Uh, Daniel Shaver was he the guy up in Mesa that got shot by the cops? Uh, don't recognize the name for sure. Argonaut. We like to travel. We enjoy adventures and such. And uh, so it's not terrible. Besides, Eva's not a big fan of the desert anyhow. She's allergic to everything here. <laughs> cactus, Palo Verde. They heck with cactus. Yeah, winging it. That's good. Cactus suck rocks. <laughs> yeah, I think Chris would like us to... Uh, um, Kind of keep this off of the uh, YouTube algorithm. <laughs> I think we're all pretty much in agreement here. So I think uh, Chris Georgie wants me to keep from getting another strike. It depends on the allergies, Lito. Um, in in Eva's case, it, yeah, that didn't work too well. She was allergic to cactus and Palo Verde and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it could get interesting, Forrest. Say, so love to see you again sometime. Maybe we can get together sometime this summer or weather. Yeah, agreed, Leto. So, well, it's 9.49 now, and I don't see any more mining questions, etc. cetera. So, so unless somebody has any more mining questions, I think I'm going to uh, call it a night. And... Uh, get to bed because I've got a long day tomorrow, next couple of days. So I'll know shortly after noon tomorrow how, how things should go because that's going to be the first big grade. And uh, we'll see how everything holds up on that. If it handles that, it should be fine. Thank you, Lito. And uh, Good we'll, night, everybody. we'll do our best. So thank you all for being here. It's been a fun night. Had a good time. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll get back with you as soon as uh, it's appropriate. How is gold ore made? Well, if you go to, I think, my video number one, where does gold come from? <laughs> it'll, it'll tell you that, Lars. Um, and also there's, uh, I think it's Ore Deposits 101 is a series on YouTube uh, that's really complicated, not complicated, but comprehensive and does a great job of all different kinds of ore deposits. And so good night, everybody. And yeah, Lido, that's where it starts. <laughs> Uh, and happy prospecting and keep it safe out there. Uh, let's see. Stream.